I mean, I, <laughs> at this time, I'm going to call the Paris Union High School District Special Board meeting to order. At 9.45 a.m. And I'm going to ask for a roll call to, turn, to de determine a quorum. Trustee Nelson? Here. Trustee Vallejo? Here. Trustee Stafford? Here. Trustee Campos? Here. And myself, here. We have established a quorum. Item 3.1, let me click on that. Invitation to address the Board of Trustees, closed session items only. No, no cards today. Okay, thank you. Item 4.1, adjourn to closed session. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Mr. Nelson and Mr. Campos, sorry. Please vote. <clears throat> There's a 5-0 vote to close session at 9.46 a.m. Do I need to hit the gavel? Sure. You're the president. I'd like to call a special board meeting in Paris Union High School District to reconvene at 11.03 a.m. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Item 6.1, revision adopt. Oh, I'm sorry, is that better? Item 6.1, revision adoption ordering of agenda, January 4th, 2024. Is there a motion? So moved. Mr. Nelson, is there a second? Mr. Stafford? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we're back. Go ahead and please vote. <laughs> Item 7.1, report out of closed session. No report out of closed session this evening, this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Do I go to 8.1? Because on the computer it's 9.1. Okay. 8.1, invitation to address Board of Trustees non-agendized items. No takers today. All right. Thank you. 
Item 9.1, study session. The Board of Trustees will conduct a study session regarding novels. Well, I want to thank you all for being here, especially when, um, you know, we're still, students aren't back in session. No, many of you are still on vacation or break, uh, but it was nice of you to give up some time, the board and Mr. Bennett and all the folks behind me. Um, this is not the end, but a, a very important juncture in a process that was started a long, long time ago. Um, about a year and a half ago, Ms. Zerold, our previous director of um, curriculum instruction, um, came to me and said, hey, we have a few dollars and um, I'm going to order new novels. I'm going to ask the department chairs what novels they would like ordered. And I said, you know, I'd really like you to hold off and I, I think we need to do something a little bit more sophisticated. Um, I know that in the past maybe that's how books were ordered. But we really need, I think, more voices and more eyes and to develop a process. And we began, um, at that point, we, ha we did have an equity team in place was much smaller, it was a group of teachers, and uh, we began looking at novels that we would eventually be bringing to the board, um, and, and not getting rid of any novels, but novels to augment and add to the collection, and we've done a little bit of presentation with you pri prior to that. Um, we had the good fortune um, as we began that process, we had some uh, two teachers who are amazing, and that was Matt Thomas and Julie Harris, who are our academic coaches. Um, and they began looking at, through a, a long list of, of novels that could be potentially um, you know, interesting and beneficial and great learning opportunities for our kids. Um, eventually, we added um, Dr. McNair's position. And she, as I think you're aware, expanded the equity team out quite a bit and added um, some classified folks and additional teachers and people throughout um, the different employees throughout the entire district. And that really added a richness to the equity team. And they began looking at this list of books. And then as you know, we've, we've hired a new director of curriculum instruction, Ms. Cahoon. Um, so they have begun, picked up kind of where we began and today is really them taking you through the process, some of the things that were proposed. Obviously, you're not voting to approve these today. It's a study session for an opportunity for you to ask questions, know what the process was, what's being proposed. And in addition to the novels, of course, we had the approval of AB 101, asking districts to pilot and ultimately present. Uh, it's a, re a graduation requirement, um, and you're aware of those timelines. Uh, an ethnic studies course. And while the state mandated that we have to provide, we being districts, an ethnic studies course, it's pretty loose on how that ethnic studies course, that's largely left up to district. So again, a similar process ensued. Um, if I go to the next slide, um, this has been put through a lot of different folks and a lot of different lenses to, to have a, a, a lot of vantage points. Um, again, the curriculum committee, um, we had some amazing teachers. You'll see a list there from Ms. Rizzo, Ms. Alvarado, Ms. Good, who's here today. Uh, who else is here? Mr. Salcedo is here today. I want to thank him. So several of the teachers on this committee, um, because you never want a top-down decision. You always want the people you're leading to be a part of the process. So they will, they're going to present to you today. Um, we also had a parent committee. Um, we thought, you know, we're, we're serving our, our parents, and they should have some input. So they're going to talk to you about what the parent input was today. And ultimately, a student committee. Um, one of the things that um, there had previously been a student listening um, sessions, but um, Dr. McNair really you know, took those to a whole new level. I think Mr. Bennett has shared with you that the listening sessions we've had over the last year have been much richer, much nuanced, much more focused. And um, we had, uh, I want to thank Mr. Thomas and Julie Harris, Dr. Cahoon, and um, Dr. McNair, who put together an amazing listening session. Uh, I think it was a month ago. Was it a month ago? November. Where in November, where we um, brought the books to the students. We asked the parents if they could take a look at these books, and they said yes. And it was really insightful to hear their input on, on what books they would like to see brought to them and their peers. So that's kind of an overview um, and an introduction, um, and I'm going to turn it over to the two directors who are really guiding and leading this work, and I want to thank them again, and that's um, 
um, Dr. McNair and soon to be doctor who's completed everything and well, uh, that's what I was told this morning. So I'm going to turn it over to the two doctors. Um, I think it's official next month, but she's, she's defended and she is, you know, there. So I have two doctors to present to you. I'm going to hand it over to much more capable people than I. Good morning. Happy New Year. All right. So I'm going to start a little bit with how we got to the place that we're currently going on, on the road here. Um, and what's important to understand is all of this work that was completed was done so um, rooted in the mission and the vision of Paris Union High School District. Um, Today we have representatives from the various committees sitting um, and you're going to hear uh, not a lot from Dr. McNair nor myself, but a lot from those that are boots on the ground closest to the work and really were the ones that um, developed some amazing um, curriculum to bring forward to our students and help to orchestrate the identification of novels to um, invigorate the curriculum and make it more 21st century for our students. Um, the student voice was very important in all of this, um, listening to what students had to say, um, and they were a significant factor in the development of what you're going to see today. And then it's important to also remember that the teachers were the ones that really created what you're going to see. Um, and what they put together is based upon their expertise on classroom educators um, and um, what is best for kids, because they're the ones that are working every day hand to hand with our students. Um, the other piece to keep in mind as we move forward today is that this is a we initiative. This is all of us together doing what is best for our students. Um, I mentioned that this was all rooted in our vision and mission statement. As you look at our vision and mission statement, one of the words or common themes that you'll see come up is caring and care. Um, it's a lot to say a word, um, but what's important are actions. And so through that, Equity is caring in action. Um, this is how we visibly see what we're doing to support our students and show them that we care about them and their futures. Finally, um, I'm gonna end my section uh, right now on our enrollment. If you look up at our enrollment, you'll see that we do have representation from a diverse group of student populations. And one of the things that's come out um, when talking to students across the board is that they really desire to see themselves represented. And so it's important to have curriculum that represents all of our student populations because they all have something important to contribute. And it helps them identify. All right, so the next three slides are basically um, our nine strategies for equity, diversity, and inclusion um, that we've reviewed over the last couple of years here um, with the Paris Union High School District. And so today we are focusing primarily on strategy number five. Um, and so the, the three slides are here just for your reference so you know where they're coming from. Um, but we're focusing on strategy number five that says that we are adopting curriculum and instructional materials that accurately reflect the diversity amongst our student groups. And so we hope that through this presentation today that you will see that we have been extremely intentional, um, but then also very, very thoughtful, um, very careful, um, very fair, and then also just looking at what are the needs of the students that we serve and how could we best um, put those needs into practice um, as we say that we're a district that is about equity and e equity being caring in action. So what that action actually looks like. I'm now gonna introduce um, to you all um, our, one of our instructional coaches, Mr. Matt Thomas, who has been boots on the ground from the very beginning. He's been a teacher at Paloma Valley High School for a very long time, um, but he's been an instructional coach who has been vital to the novel committee um, process. Ms. Julie Harris was unable to be here today. If you're a football fan, um, I can't remember the college that her husband um, just got a job at, but he's now a head football coach at a college, I think like Iowa. Iowa, something like that. And so uh, she is getting him settled. So she was unable to be here today, um, but you will see uh, her stamp all over this presentation. Uh, so Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Dr. Wiener, esteemed school board members. Um, my name is Matt Thomas. I'm an instructional coach with the district. Uh, I've been a teacher for almost 20 years here in uh, the, the district. 
and I work with my great instructional coach partner, Julie Harris. Um, when we were brought to the district a year and a half ago, uh, one of the priorities of the previous director was we need to adopt new novels. We haven't had novels adopted since 2015, and we had two main points in line. One is we had to make sure that the novels that we adopted reflected our student population, and we wanted to make sure that the teachers had voices on which novels we should adopt. And so we established the Novel Adoption Committee. We had our first meeting. Um, we invited all the English teachers of the district. We knew all couldn't attend, of course. So the ones that were able to attend, they would bring the information back and share it with the teachers to get all the teachers' voices at the individual sites. Um, and so we had our first meeting. Uh, teachers submitted novel ideas. We had 55 novels at the end of that meeting. And we said, okay, we know we need to pare this down. So what we did was we looked at it from the teacher's perspective. We said, okay, um, where can we put these novels, right? We need, can't teach novels in isolation. We need to have a purpose and value with it. So we looked at the adopted curriculum, and we said, okay, this novel can fit this theme. This novel can fit that theme. And we wanted a diverse collection of novels because we didn't want multiple novels teaching the same thing. And again, we wanted novels that re represent our student body. And so once we did that, we looked at all 55 novels. We knew we had to pare it down a little bit. And so we, we ran it through the lens of diversity and equity. We wanted to make sure that our students were represented. We wanted to make sure um, that, um, excuse me, that all themes are represented so we can have a diverse collection. We ran it through our, our novel scorecard and that pared down the novels quite a bit. We took that collection of novels back to the individual sites. The teachers took them back there, presented the novels through PLCs, voted, the teachers voted on which novels they supported. They brought it back to us. We did a vote, we went back to the site again, ran it through a second round for teachers. We had our final vote for the novels and that brought us to the 23 novels um, that, that you've seen in the past there. Um, and then just a reminder, uh, last June you got a, a folder that uh, um, collected all this information and showed you specifically the whole timeline of that. Thank you very much. Perfect, okay. so. When, uh, before we go on, so I, I'd like us to introduce or to meet some of these authors. We have four authors here. Is it all good? Oh, perfect. Thank you. This first one is from the novel Sanctuary. Uh, so let's hear from the author's voice on purpose and, and, and what she was thinking when she was writing this novel. I think we, you know, we have, we've been talking to some, uh, some middle schools and high schools now, which has been really, really fun. So we're talking to students who are this age and... Um, it's fascinating to see, like, Valley doesn't want to be an activist. Valley doesn't want to be a revolutionary. She doesn't want to be in the limelight. She doesn't want, you know, she's not like someone who's even going to go try out for the spring play. She's a very a thoughtful, um, a, a thoughtful teenager. She wants, you know, I mean, she's concerned about friends and lip gloss and, like, things that we all are concerned about. There's no part of her that's like, I'm going to change the world when we start the book and she's forced into this role and I think that's how a lot of us learn our our skills you know is that we're forced into it I didn't want the circumstances I was raised in and she certainly does not want the circumstances she's raised in and so it was fun seeing a class the other day be like well like how do you learn how to fend for yourself like that or how do you know that there are they didn't know you know exactly what it meant to be undocumented, and Paola's really, really great at explaining it to any age. Um, but it was really fun to see how a 16 year old processes that literally, like right in front of you. All right, so that was author of Sanctuary. Um, let's go to our next one, which is Luis Rodriguez, uh, author of Always Running. Oh, thank you. All right, so perfect. Thank you so much. There, you go. there, there it is. <coughs> well, 11 years old, I started my first gang. Around 12 years old, I started doing drugs. When I was 15, I got kicked out of school. So that's where I ended up living in the streets. And somebody was going to fall through the cracks. I ended up being the one that fell through the cracks. By the time I was 18, I was facing a six-year prison sentence. By then, I was already hooked on heroin. I had lost 25 friends. They ended up dying. They ended up becoming heroin addicts, or they ended up in prison. 
There's almost a part of me really wanted to die. But the, the, it wasn't in the cards. You know, the way things fell, I got shot at half a dozen times and never got hit. Including machine gun fire, point blank range. So I went through all that and I survived it. So I was floating in this world of deep, intense experiences, but I was surviving it all. So the world kept saving me in many ways and I didn't know it. Everything around me was dying. Until finally, I think, in my consciousness, I began aware, I better think about something else now. Me being the weird homie with the books was important. Because when you read books, whole worlds open up to you, even though your world is so limited and you think there's no way out of it. But I had a world of books, which, again, I didn't know anybody in my neighborhood that did. And everybody that I told thought I was crazy. Even my family. Oh, man, you were in gangs, you were on drugs. Now you want to be a writer? Forget it. You're lost now. That was like the worst thing I could ever want to be. But it was something so compelling to me. I don't know what it was to tell the story of what I knew and my homies that were dead. And I wanted to write about this world. Not Rodriguez. It's an Indian mother noiseless cry. And that's Luis Rodriguez. And now uh, America Ferreira. Author of American Life. One of my pieces in the book. Um, I, I, I tried for so long to make sense of my, of all the things I cared about. I was a passionate performer and I wanted to be a storyteller, but I also, you know, cared about human rights and, and, you know, wanted to engage in the wider world around me. And I thought for so long that I couldn't be both of those things and mm -hmm. that, and that I had to pick a box or pick a lane or find a title that made sense to other people. And, and I, and I really like wrecked myself over it. And I would say up until about five years ago, my second piece is really about um, sort of that growth where I finally found the courage um, to say, I am all of these things. And, and I'm going to choose to, to walk into any space as everything that I am. And I think that that is such a big uh, part, that's, that's such a big umbrella of what this book is about. We all of the people who've written have in some way had to walk into certain spaces understanding that not all of them is welcome. You can come in here as the Brooklynite, but not as the Palestinian. You can come in here as the American, but please don't like, you know, don't make us feel uncomfortable with, you know, your Spanish speaking or whatever it is. And finally, uh, Westmore. Um, let me get the timing on this one. Westmore. ...deliberate about the expectations that we're setting. And, and that, honestly, I think President Bush said it best when he talked about this idea, this, this soft bigotry of low expectations, where we just have different expectations for different kids who come up in different communities. You know, I remember once, um, I, 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 wrote, I wrote this story called, called The Other Westmore, talking to myself and another young man from Baltimore, who he's currently, uh, with the same name from the same area, similar family backgrounds, he's currently in year 16 of his life sentence in prison for at the same time I had received a Rhodes Scholarship, uh, he was convicted for the murder of a police officer. And so the story kind of detailed the lives of these two kids and what ends up happening that causes this split with the same names. And I remember once speaking with him, and I asked him, we were talking about Baltimore, and I said, so do you think that we're products of our environments? And he looked back at me and he said, actually, I think we're products of our expectations. And I thought to myself, he is absolutely right. We were not products of our environments. We were products of our expectations. And someone once said to me, it's a real shame that you lived up to your expectations, and he didn't. And I told him, actually, the real shame is that we both did. We both lived up to our expectations. And so when we're talking about things like creating hope and opportunity, the very first thing we have got to do is this soft bigotry of low expectations that we have for so many kids and so many communities, for things that they were born into and for things they should not be ashamed of. We have to be able to psychologically change the bars and the barriers. You know, Booker T. Washington once said, and he said it best, and I'll paraphrase when he said, if you break a man's spirit, you do not have to escort him to the back door because he will walk there himself. 
And we have far too many people who are walking there by themselves. Thank you. So those are excerpts from four of the novels. Each of the novels that we uh, looked at and um, uh, analyzed, they all have powerful messages and, and um, our students can relate to them, characters that, that our students can feel like they're a part of them. Thank you. So what you've seen so far was just a preview. Um, we took our students through uh, many of the Meet the Authors, um, and as Mr. Bruff mentioned, um, they did have parent permission slips to attend this session with us. Um, and so what we wanted to do is see if you all would like a break to kind of take some time to flip through um, the packet that has the novel summaries, um, just because we knew that for the sake of today, um, we could probably spend the full day going through each novel. Um, to see if you wanted to go through the novel summaries. And then because this is a study session, we open it up for questions for the novels. Um, so would you like a break, Mr. President? Okay, so we'll put 10 minutes and we'll um, come back in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Um, it's the board. It's the BP and the AR. Thirteen, twelve point two. Donna, what's our time? Okay. We have about three and a half minutes. Let us know if you need more time. Three and a half. You're welcome. Okay, no problem. Are there any questions that we can answer right now, or would you like to wait to the end, Mr. President? Okay, perfect. Thank you. You wait. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Perfect.
We have about a minute and 13 seconds. More time. What's that? Oh, yeah, you guys have it up in here. You want to display it? Yeah. How much more time do we have? Just less than a minute. Okay. We've got about one more minute, and then we'll be reconvening. It outlines how to handle rather than the old view. Right. Okay, minute. Thank you.
All right, thank you. Okay, well, we're coming back. In the break, I believe there was a question from the board president asked of Mr. Williams, so I heard it secondhand, or Mr. Campos, and I think I want to make sure we had the question right. Is there board, current board policy on um, like appropriate language? Appropriate language. Grammar, um, the we do not have board language that, or ARs um, that speak to that. The closest would be uh, 6144, which is controversial issues, and we've displayed that here for you. And it covers the gamut of a lot of things, but it's really related to issues related to the course of study. It provides opportunities for critical thinking that controversial issues of any kind um, have to meet the, this criteria, that the issue has a meaningful relationship to matters that concern the students, that has to be available information about it, sufficient to allow alternative points of view, all sides of issues are given. Um, the, if you jump down to number six, the teachers does not use his or her personal positions, um, whether they be religious, political, economic, or some kind of social bias. So that board policy, we could take you through that if you'd like, is probably the catch-all that whenever something controversial comes up, it would be put through this lens. I'm going to go here because we've got the breakdown here. I'm going to there's, there's really no, there's no warnings of explicit sexual content, um, language. Um, and so, you know, us in reading it, it's kind of like, oh, it seems like a very wholesome book. Like which which novel are you referring to? I'm, I'm on the same guy you are. I'm not your perfect next to know. Okay, yep. Written by uh, Sa author Sanchez. said to the, I just want to make sure, yeah, 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 yeah. So you're these, these speaking are to just, his or her brother that you're being an able. Well, th th these are just communications with friends. It's, it's a whole dialogue with someone. Yeah, there it's all dialogue, right? Yeah. Um, oh, like I hate you, I'm sure one that says, how can you hate 
hate nature. I grow, I, I grow more exasperated by him by the minute because that's the first time that she's met. Um, and he was just like, I just do. It's boring. So what do you like to do for fun? What is your idea of you? His response. Shopping, partying, and effing. He laughed. And I'm not going to say a word because it's not in, I just don't, you know, he's seen it. It's bad enough. I don't want to say it. Out of respect for all of you. And so, so that to me is kind of concerning. Um, over here, story short, if I were to approve this with this kind of summary without it clearly stating that there's sexual content, there's other sexual content, that content that's in this that I just don't think is appropriate for a public school situation. Now, again, and, and I don't I don't fault us, and to me the author, it, it's actually a really, really good story. It really is. I think it brings up, there's a lot of things there that hit home for me, which that's why I think, you know what? She's expressing a very good story. Did it really need the explicit content, the language, the vulgarities? Um, and, and many of the times, I felt it was kind of like, you didn't need to put that. It's just good. Yeah, I mean, it, it's like you didn't need to do that. And, and so, as an educational institution, I, I these are concerns that I have now. I didn't read the rest of the book. I, I did also go over um, the Hey Dude. Again, I thought that was very, I thought it was a good story. You know, but, but too many times also, I think that we're, and, and I know that this wasn't part of the book when I looked at the handbook about some of the, the content. It's like I didn't want stereotypical type stuff. For example, the gentleman, um, you know, the, the Hispanic guy who was, uh, um, or Latino that was. Uh, Louis Rodriguez yeah. always runs. Okay, so, and this is kind of, me growing up in my culture or my environment, you know, I did have family members who were gay men, and and that was kind of like they saw it like, well, that's kind of who we are. And it's like, well, we're not all like that. There are some, and and so for me, it, it, and this, this is where it becomes very difficult because I had a very mild um, upbringing. Sports was my kind of out, um, and, and I did it. And, and you know, I made a lot of very poor decisions uh, based on the culture that was out there. Always going against what my mom and dad had told me and raised me to do. And through that, you kind of end up in situations like he's mentioned. You end up in situations like, well, I feel lost in my life. Like, you know, what, what were we thinking? Do we do anything? So this and this book promotes a lot of. So for example. She talks about if she would have gotten pregnant, she learned immediately what she would have done. She would have aborted the child. Now, that goes into the controversial topic. And that can go both ways. Because in, in this particular situation, she 
entertaining it. He's like, you know what? I made a mistake. I can get rid of it very quickly. So a lot of the Hispanic culture, Mexican culture, Latino culture, a lot of it is that's very big. It's a big topic, and and, and life is important. Um, but there's both sides. You know what I mean? There, there's both sides to look at that, and I understand that. And so in dealing with it, to me, a lot of the vibes that this book gave were stuff that completely goes against a lot of my values. I understand the, the storyline. I understand the context of what it's doing. Um, at the end of the day, I would be uncomfortable approving this book as something that I would want. Because you know what? I'm afraid of that young lady who's going to read this. And maybe there's similarities. She talks about her and her sister and her sister's passage. But like I said, it's very, the story is very good. And it was just like, wow, that was, I just felt like there was so much unnecessary stuff. And then I can, I'm concerned about the, the board policies. And, you know, now when a parent says, hey, you know what, my, my daughter was, you know, supposed to read this book to my son. And, and anyway, you kind of get yeah. where I'm going on it. And, and I just wish that at least in these stuff, because now I haven't read all of this. I, I did actually, I took the modicum, I did give it to people who are readers. I kind of told them, hey, can you give me a synopsis? You know, these are the assumptions on that concerns not concerns, and so I'll, I'll bring that back and I'll have, you know, more information, but not all of them, but I, I know that I want to read through some of these now, kind of skim through and kind of get at least a review, I can go do an online search and a review and put it in language because this right here, it doesn't tell me about all the warnings, and mm -hmm. us as elected officials, sure. who do you think ends up getting, you know, I voted for that guy and that guy approved that, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and that, that for me is a great concern. And, and unless it's presented where it's like, if I understood that, that summary and it says, hey, you know, it has explicit words, then I understand, okay, maybe I want to look into that book a little bit more, see what's in there. But not knowing it, it's a buttload of books. I just now, I am very hesitant to prove anything on that book. And I know that initially, when I had, um, when we had talked about this and I kind of saw <coughs> very, in my opinion, story in there, you know, there's an autobiography, I don't see one on Ben Carson, I don't see Thomas Sowell, people who are great contributors, and I don't see Dennis Prager in there, Ben Shapiro, obviously people, people, Candace Owens, people would put them as controversial people, and it's like, well, yeah, but you're putting other people who are of the similar races, um, but they represent a political ideology, which I think a lot of this book ends up having that, and so... For me, it, like I said, I would like to see balance. If, if we're going to bring forward books, and I would like to see balance on both sides, I just think sometimes that the conservative side is really the big man, and you know maybe maybe I want to conserve something that has been conserved in my family, and and you know that's the way that we do it. Um, and a lot of these topics that are in this book, you know, they go against what, but I, I'm not. The end all say all. You know what I mean? That's why I said the book's a good book because mm -hmm. it hits on a lot of different things. And and so to me, it's kind of like, yeah. And is is it a result of you know what can be out there? Absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. um, at the same time, you know, it, it almost seems like almost any time you're going to get into these novels, it's going to be about an impoverished family. You know that 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 their people of color are going to be impoverished and they're going to outlive education. Or there's a lot of successful uh, families that are people of color who brought up in a completely different environment with the environment of, hey, this is how, kind of like the Huxtables and stuff. Like, you you have people who, like, they were professionals, they were raised a certain way, and they had those expectations, which a lot of times, and they kind of mention in this book, they say, oh, you're being white. That's white. I've always taken that term as offensive, personally, as, as a person of color, as a Mexican, because it's like, okay, so are you saying that because we're pursuing excellence in education, or we're pursuing these different stereotypes other people have that were white, like they own, you know, and, and nothing against white people, you know what I mean? To me, it's just, all that means is that their priorities, I guess what people think their priorities are priorities that other cultures don't have, and, and I don't agree with that. I, I absolutely, there, it doesn't matter your, your socioeconomic status, there are families that are impoverished who raise kids to be great, successful people because they have the same recipe as the 
correct education. Maybe your life wasn't um, a good one. You know, Larry L. Uh, when I read the story about Larry Elder's dad and what he went through and what he accomplished, and what he accomplished to give his son <coughs> the ability to pay for college, to be an attorney, to be someone that is a powerful force in, in America. You know, to me that I just think a lot of this, a lot of that can be met with a lot of respect. And I, I don't want to paint anybody in, in a bad light. And I know it's hard to do because every culture is vast. You have good, bad, you have everything in between. Everybody can be successful. And I, and I think the message that I, I would like to see is positive, hey, you know what? It doesn't matter what your upbringing is. You do this, that, and the other. Kind of like a recipe for success. And I think you know we can all agree uh, being educated, uh, mathematically, You made so many good salient points there that I'm not sure which one to respond to, and I want to make sure if there's a question that you have of me or the team as you're presenting. So I, I think there were several, and then you made several points. I think the key one is just to make sure that we're following our guidelines, if we have guidelines, to explicit content, what we're learning. Because it could be, if we're okay and allowing it in a book to be read and students to read it, then I don't think that we're okay with the teacher losing in a classroom setting. No, all of these were books that could be and will, should be, will be used in a classroom setting. No, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is, is so me as a, as a PE teacher, you know, if I said something that could be used Yep, all of them. So I, I think you hit on a couple of really salient points. If we look at literature historically, it's always going to be dealing with controversial issues. If we go back to Uncle Tom's Cabin or the light narrative life of Frederick Douglass or Huckleberry Finn or up to Kill a Mockingbird. Now I've kind of, I was an ex-English teacher. Um, I, I guess once English teacher, always English teacher. I've kind of traced a trajectory there of, you know, the books that confront racism in the American canon. So those at each of their times when they were presented as books to be read in public education were very controversial books. So I think there was a balance struck here that was tried to be struck in that when they look at kids, what are the books or the issues or the concerns that kids are wrestling with in their lifetimes today? And those are things like getting out of poverty. Those are things like the... Um, immigrant experience, or in, in one book's case, the um, um, being an illegal immigrant experience. Um, the, the one author was the author, you know, two kids, one ends up being on the route to prison, the other. The point I'm making here is any of these issues, if we're going to pick characters who are dealing with a modern day concern, they're going to speak and talk like characters would. The book Always Running deals with that author's journey out of a life of gangs and finding, as you said, education and find his way out. So you always have this controversy of characters who speak like people would in the modern day world. Um, what should be, and your question I really think is, how do you draw the line between, okay, we want realistic speaking characters. Um, you know, Huck Finn wouldn't have been written like, hey, my black friend Jim why don't you come get on a raft with me? There were other inappropriate words that I won't say and never use the word that that book has in it. And a lot has been written in education about should that book be read, not read. But it does beg the question, I'm not going to get down that lane with you, but what are the mores or the norms that make that are beyond words that shouldn't be in books that kids read? And yet what stories are realistic and deal with issues that characters would really be dealing with and, ask, and asking our students to wrestle with those big issues. That is a huge question. You're asking the very right question. My initial response is that's why this is a study session. I want to thank you for getting in and reading some of them. Um, it'd be easy to turn it over to Matt and say, hey, but I don't want to put him on the spot. You know, all 23 books, because they started with a long list, got down. Teachers have read all of these books. Um, we could certainly go back and look for, I don't know, is it possible to do word counts of, or search fors of? We talked about doing some, a revised 
novel summary. Yeah, and, and how many are there curse words? Are there words of sexual content? I don't, I, we can certainly come back. And that's the purpose of this as a study session, to answer these very questions. But it is a very challenging thing to bring works that are meaningful and present with characters who, I think we struggle with this as parents now with modern day movies, right? I mean, my kids probably wouldn't watch Leave it to Beaver if I put it on. They'd be like, kids don't talk that way, or Happy Days even, or I don't know, even the Huxtables. Um, they would want characters who were more modern and speak and deal with and wrestle with the issues that kids are wrestling with today. So I have a question. How do we address this to the parents, to the public? Because in the Latino culture, my mom would Flip out forbid, of, me, yeah. forbid me to even consider it. That type of language, the sexual gra graphic nature of that, that's a no-no. So that doesn't belong in public school. Any novel that is being presented to kids, to parents, do have the right to opt out. That's one thing. That so they the have an option. They have an option. So, so and would an this alternative be one assignment. Class? What's that? Would this be like a generic gen ed class, like basic uh, English or? I'm sorry. English 10. Yeah, like it English? could be English okay. 10. So you're saying when they enroll, the parents would get a heads up. Hey, this is the curriculum that's being taught, and there's an option, a form to opt in or opt out. Is that what we're saying? We are, but that, that option always exists for anything. Any parent has a right in the state of California to come look at any textbook, any book that's being presented, and if they have an objection, we make an effort to but, give them But you see what's going on in Absolutely. California, right? Like with the other school districts? Absolutely. You know, parents are trying to protect their kids, and they have that right. Absolutely. Just like I have the right to protect my kids, and I would absolutely do that. Right. But I'm telling you, as a parent, I don't want my kids talking like that. It's not allowed in my household. It's not allowed in schools. We hold, we hold teachers and, and staff at this expect, level of expectation, which is a higher level of expectation. Oh, but Right. And, and it seems like we're softening that rule to allow the younger generation to be however they want, regardless. And, and, and what bothers me is it's like we're throwing away structure. Mm -hmm. we're, you know, where, where's the morale? The morale. Or not morale. Excuse me. The um, morals. Thank you. You know. I have mixed feelings just by seeing that, you know, that that's like lead on, you know, we have a, a chart here of a summary, but doesn't give us a heads up, you know, like on the CDs, they say explicit content. So you know what you're getting into. There's no warning label. Absolutely. So how do we address that? Well, I, th I think you're giving us a task. We can go back to the list of books and we could vet um, and present to you again, any language that's of sexual nature or any, um, I don't know if that was done as part of the initial read that when teachers vetted it. I don't want to put Matt on the spot. Um, you guys are making a valid point that and folks that... I know that they use the evaluative tool in order to measure the, the novels themselves, but I'm thinking um, as a recovering English teacher as well, when you do a synopsis or summary, you're giving an overview of the novel. Right. You don't go into the details about figurative language or you know, diction or theme, um, you just kind of give an overview, but that is something that we could go back and we could add, um, like you would see almost on an album, um, a warning over um, may contain some, you know, explicit language or sexually suggestive content. Um, there's definitely a means of doing that. Or I guess one of the questions too to that is, is there no other option? I mean, I, I don't, I mean, obviously there's probably hundreds of thousands of books that are, that are being presented every year. And who's the one hand picking? And, 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 and I, I say this from the lens on the junior MTC side. I've seen some of the movements on how they, you know, they have their sure. list, you know, and they actually, you know, want banned books, you know, potentially banned books, and all the ones that are controversial and this, that, and the other. And so I'm kind of just curious as to. Well, and I believe that was the starting point of all of these, that they were from approved. Uh, I, can, I can speak a little bit. Please, yeah. please continue your thought. No, no, I, I think you're speaking to what I'm talking about, that initially these were not just books randomly picked out. They were books from recommended reading lists from various, you know, libraries of America, or um, you, I think you're going to So, speak yeah, this. so I was there from the beginning, and every concern that you say and bring up is a great concern, and it was brought up and, and talked about a lot. And so I'll tell you from a teacher's perspective, because I'm, I'm a teacher. I support other teachers now, and yes, I, my office is at Student Services, but I'm, I'm a teacher at Student Services. So as an English teacher for 17 years, 
looking through the text, our, our goal was to bring curriculum to the students, right? Make it relevant for them. Make it something they're interested in. And if, they're, if they have interest, then they'll, they'll dive into it and then you know, magic can happen, right? We can, we can create those learning opportunities. If they don't see characters that reflect them, they, they tend to tune out. But my role as a teacher is this. I look at it like this. So I go, okay, what could, will, will concern parents? Okay, this will concern parents. So I'm not gonna teach that. So as a teacher, I go in with a theme, with a, pur a, a purpose in mind. So if I'm teaching this novel, there's a purpose behind it. The language that I, that I don't want to share in class, the, the parts of the novel I don't want to share, I leave out because it doesn't fit my purpose. So I looked at it, and when we looked at all these novels, I looked at it from the teacher's perspective. And I don't teach entire novels through. I'll look at the theme of what my goal is, what's valuable to the students, what's purposeful for them, what supports their success out of school. Right? That's my goal as a teacher. And I look at what I'm going to teach, and that's the parts that we, that we read. Everything else we, we don't address, the things that don't concern me, the things that I think would be controversial, the things that I don't want to teach, the things I think parents would have an issue with. Because as a teacher, I need to support the parents as well. I'm supporting the students, make them successful, but I also have to keep the parents in mind as well. Um, and so we looked at that, well, and that, that's the goal of the teacher. Now, the, the, another goal of the teacher is to create a great learning environment and create a great connection with our students. So as a, as a teacher who creates great connections with the students, when the students come in, they want to be in my class. They want to hear what I have to say. I have to keep that in mind as well. So they understand when I'm telling students, hey, guys, we're not going to read this part. If they, if they happen to see a word in there like, hey, why didn't we read that part? I'm like, I'm just, we're just going to skip that part. And my students get it. They understand. They've been in my class long enough. My goal is to do everything I can to support the students' instruction. They know I'm doing best by them. And so addressing your concerns, was, that, that was addressed a lot when we went through these novels. What theme can we teach? And what parts are controversial, we do have that written out. When we looked at all 55 novels, the teachers did go through, write out the great things, what we can do with those as teachers, what concerns <coughs> do we have as teachers? And so talking about revising the, the statements, the, the summaries, we have those documents, we can put in the concerns in there. So that we have those, so that teachers can see, okay, I gotta make sure that I don't really address this on page whatever, so that you all can see that as well. We do have that information. Well, and I think we spoke originally about wanting a lot of lenses on them. Your lenses board is perhaps the most important. Like you're saying, we've got to prove things. So teachers have looked at these. Students have looked at them with permission, by the way. That's why we said it was important before the board approves it. If we're going to give a student an unapproved book, we, we wanted um, parent permission to say, hey, your students are going to look at new and possibly alternate books. And parents and now the board to bring that lens in. So this is not a, a list to say, hey, vote on it now. It's to have this very discussion as we engage books that will be exciting and interesting and controversial <clears throat> because controversy is what invokes, I think this is part of what Matt's saying, thought. Um, whether it is the, the um, immigration debate or the abortion debate or all the debates you can think of, great literature is going to deal with those debates, and we want our students wrestling with those ideas. But we don't want them being brainwashed or jingoistic convinced or given a particular political perspective or a racial perspective or social perspective. So it's a tight balance. Um, we can certainly go back and vet each of these books and do, is there any lascivious language or any inappropriate curse language? Um, you probably, with modern novels, will have some of that in those novels to a certain extent. And I, I don't think we're disputing what you said, because actually I agree with yeah. almost everything. I think the fact that as board members, we're elected to protect our youth. Absolutely. You know, and that's number one. And as Mr. Campos is saying, and if I, correct me if I'm wrong, you're recognizing stuff that we weren't allowed to deal with when we were growing up. But here's the, here's the catch. We're talking about being innovative. We're talking about leading the way. California's not leading the way. We're one of the worst right now academically. So how does immigration, how does birth control, how does abortion, how does sexual orientation lead the way? I, I get it. I get these are all topics we all want to talk about. We want to talk to our youth. We want to talk to other, other board members. Whoever, we just want to talk about it because we need to get it off our chest. I believe, regardless, schools is a safe place for everyone. It doesn't matter who, what, when, where, and why, period. 
but we're supposed to be focused on academics. Yeah. We're not supposed to be talking about political agendas, political views all the time. We could have that conversation outside of education, outside of off, off the clock per se. I don't have a problem with addressing this for the community. I believe parents need to know what they're being, their kids are being taught. There needs to be an opt out form. And you said we could vet through the books. Shouldn't that have already been done? No, the books have been vetted and read. They've been, all the books have been read by our teachers, teacher committee. So let me ask you the word. common question. And I think the majority of us here are parents. Would you allow your children to read those books? I'll be honest. I haven't read that book. I have not read all the books on the list. Um, that's that's I, kind of know, the we, point. We have yeah. to have groups of people that do that. Yeah. I, I, I'm a little uncomfortable with that particular passage myself. So. Well, yeah, the language was vulgar. Yeah. And some of the things, too, that, like, and, and this, is, this, is, this is what gets difficult. Um, you know, we try to, you know, nowadays jokes are like, you can't say them because they have these stereotypes behind them, right? And so, and, and understood, right? But when they make, you know, jokes about, you know, oh, that white person, or it could be done about, you know, those Mexicans or, you know, the black people or, or, or this or the Asians, or, it could, it's, if there's any one of those members in that classroom, it's going to strike a chord. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have that conversation, but I know if you're going to be, if the kids read this passage and they say, oh, well, you know, and, and in this specific case, it's, it's white, right? And so, and they paint white people as almost negative because of who they are and what their expectations and what their, their values are there. And, and I just, I think it, it, it triggered, we're in a lose, lose situation. And so for me, it's, it's very difficult to now introduce literature that isn't going to offend someone. And, and either we're okay with it. And, and the other concern, too, is like, are teachers really equipped to deal with some of that? Because once you start it, darts go everywhere. And I've seen it in, in middle school PE where something, you know, I might be saying something, whatever, and a kid will say something that's trying to trigger a response, whether it's, you know, um, race, sex, gender, whatever it is. And I kind of just like, whoa, you know, and, and obviously I'm a Peter, but boy, that's, we're not going to talk about, talk about that at home. You know what I mean? Keep that, you know, somewhere else. But it can then become an onslaught and it could be, it could be very divisive. It could, it could get very ugly. And, and I, and, and, and I don't know like what the answer is. You know, my hope is that, you know, I would have liked this story to be told because it's a good story. You know, that there's a lot of value to it. Um, but just in a way that, that, I'll be honest with you, this is the kind of stuff that I knew, if I knew what was going on, my kids would be in public or private schools. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not a good position to be in, you know what I mean? Because I think the public school system is the, the biggest net out there, and it, it's, we're trying to capture everybody and, and, and bring out the best in them. Now, you know, I don't know if, you know, some of these topics are going to, it's going to work against us, you know. Um, and that I don't know. And, and again, that obviously we have a staff of professionals, um, I just, it, it's, without me knowing how exactly it would be taught, I mean, I, I couldn't approve it, you know, just, just, and I'm being honest with you because, and that's sad because there's, there's so much good content in there. And so I'm, I'm like torn, you know what I mean? I think you're wrestling with an age old question. Uh, first of all, I agree with everything you're saying. Um, if you think back to high school and the text you might've read as a high school student, I don't know what they were. But as an English teacher, I can tell you books like To Kill a Mockingbird, very controversial when it was first adopted by schools. Um, fair, mice and Men. I don't know if you're familiar with the story where a best friend literally shoots his friend in the back of the head as an act of kindness. That's one of the great debates in the novel at the end. Um, very controversial. There's some there's racial language in there. There's sexual language in there. Um, I could take you through some passages in Shakespeare that might curl your toes if you really understood them. Um, Romeo and Juliet is a pretty dicey, sexually graphic uh, narrative. So is Hamlet. So is Macbeth. So my only point is, and I'll turn it right over to the question. That's the purpose of the study question session. Here is we're dealing with an age-old question. How do we bring modern works that will grapple with controversial issues that is part of education, students grappling with controversial issues, and yet what should be approved and what's new and over the line, and where is that line? You said it, and I'm just agreeing with you. It's very hard to find that place 
which is why this is a study session. And as we've listened to teachers, the kids are like, hey, these are really exciting books. We would want to read these books. Well, you can see if you're a young person why some of them might be. But now we're hearing from the board. Well, we've got, we've got norms. We've got rules. We, we're, our name is going to be on these. That's the reason for today. So we can go back, and that's why you were given those books and you read them. So we can go back and do further digging and present richer. We, didn't, we know this is not the end-all, be-all, but I'll stop. No, no, no. So no. you I, want to make a point. I, I actually like everything that we're talking about right now. I think my focal point would be on policies and practices to implement these books, the novels. You know, we're talking about people's life, life experiences. Uh, there's a book called The Black Hand, and I know you would know about that, right? The Black? The Black Hand? I don't know that book. Oh. Okay, well, then, then how about this? Do a little bit of reading. Okay. You'll find out. A lot of, a lot of us have experience, experiences of that in our lives. Um, Who wrote I, the book? I should have remembered that one, too. Um, he's an ex-Mafia member. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. But it, the point being is a lot of people have different life experiences, but my goal is to find out how do we implement policies and practices? Like I was hearing the gentleman talking about, I would implement this. I would avoid certain chapters or pages of the book, but not all teachers will. Because let's, let's face reality. There's teachers that say, okay, go ahead, read the book. And then they're going to sit back and do whatever they're doing while the kids are quote unquote reading. Mm -hmm. Right? So how do we protect that? So it's uh, not like we're going to tear a page out of the book. That's a terrific question. A lot of this has to go into training and that's training that is super important. Um, I want to give you a quick response. Um, for any of the controversial books I've described to you that are previously canonized books, meaning they're part of almost read in every high school in America, right? Um, you you have to do some setup to what my colleague, Mr. Um, Thomas, was saying. You're going to encounter this. This is how we, if, if, if you were going to teach Huck Finn, you've got to address the class. You're going to hear that word that is an unspeakable word but yet, historically, we're dealing with a book on slavery here, if you're going to read the narrative of Frederick Douglass. So you have to set that up and frame that. What he was suggesting, I don't want to speak too much for Mr. Thomas, but if we were reading, say, a nonfiction magazine article on um, immigration debate, and then you wanted to read a chapter from a book from a character who was speaking to You'd want to bring in balanced sides to that. Before you jump into something like that in a social studies class or a literature class, you're going to have to do a lot of what we call framing and say, hey, you might, we're about to enter a topic that you might have different opinions on. Your parents might have different. You have to be respectful. There are words we don't use there. And teach kids how to engage controversial subjects is a big part of what we have to do now and it's particularly complicated. I don't want to open it up too broad here. We know that kids can go online now and look at anything and everything that none of us would argue isn't obscene. I mean, they have access to any obscene thing in the world. I'm not suggesting we bring those in the classroom. I'm saying that we've got to, as educators, teach kids how to have dialogue and debate and kind of what you're saying. This is a professional setting. It's an academic setting. There's a way to talk about controversial issues, and there are ways not to. Right. That is a big part of how we educate our kids today. The literature we bring to them is sort of the vehicle to have those lessons. But, but I think I'm talking more of a bigger picture because right now the focal point is the classroom, and, and obviously that's a key yeah. element. But I'm talking about these opt-out forms and parent notifications before the kids take the class. How do we address that? Can we do that? I know we, we absolutely can, can do that. So one of the and I think that would be safer for us. Like I said, look what's going on in other school districts. You know, we got parents protesting. If you give them an option, that puts us in a safe zone. Absolutely. So one of the things, and all, it sounds like she might have an answer to that, is one of the things that might come out of this study session and the board input is whatever novels eventually get adopted by this body. I'm not saying it'll be these 23. Maybe you remove some. Maybe we add some. I don't know. Um, it is possible to come up with a not just novel description, but warning these are the ideas or the concepts or some things that your child will be exposed to and you could opt out. We could have committees. Uh, my, I would say that isn't going to be done by the assistant superintendent or even the director. That would go back to teachers to look at the books and, and create an opt-out form for each novel. 
Um, those have not existed historically in education for, like if a student reads Catcher in the Rye. Some of you might have read that in high school, and some of you might think that's a great book, and some of you might think a book that starts out with, it's about suicide, it's about uh, sexuality, it's about a lot of really controversial things. <laughs> None of you probably got an opt-out form for that book when you read it, or of Mice and Men when you read it, or To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, there's a character who's a heroin addict in To right. Kill a Mockingbird. Which I understand we're in a different time. But another question I have is what about the teachers? What if they're uncomfortable with reading that to their students? Teachers always have a choice, absolutely, in how they handle, and no teacher would be expected to teach a book that they were uncomfortable teaching. They, the, by the way, these are books that are added to, if you look at the top of that list, did they get the pre-approved list as well? Um, it was in their, their notebooks in It's June. in your notebook. So these we are can not get it for like you again. we're getting rid of To Kill a Mockingbird and we're adding this book. These are now additional choices that teachers would have if they choose to read those. Does that make sense? Yes, and then can you do the, uh, a brief, super brief question sure. of what the law says in regards to these books and what we need to understand? What the law, I, I don't know the, I'm not so sure I understand. These are on the state approved list. We wouldn't pull books. Yeah, all the books that have been presented to you, believe it or not, are on a state approved list. <coughs> there is no book that isn't on American Library Association or California Department of Education. That was the starting point That's for the, the books. For um, it's an option. It's an option. Thanks. <laughs> I, yeah, I appreciate you helping me. Uh, it's a good question. Yeah. It's a much larger question than I can even answer. That um, there is a state committee of people, usually teachers, administrators, parents. I wonder if they have students who go through books every year, and these are books that are vetted and approved to be taught in. And we started with those lists. So believe it or not, all the books you've been presented, 50-something originally, read by two of our coaches. Then they got down to 20-something, read by our teachers. Then it was put through other. Am I answering your question? It's a hard question. It's a very, because it's a very good question. Yeah. Yeah. I, should I read it? <laughs> I don't know. Um, Oh, okay. Um, I want to make sure we're answering your questions. Well, I was going to show them this, this particular slide. Oh, so, this for example, helpful. this is what Mr. Bruff was referring to. So, currently, for this particular 10th grade unit in Essential Questions, there are two currently adopted novels, um, Night and Lord of the Flies. And so, the under review is The Midnight Library and Poet X. So, the teacher would then have four novels to choose from to teach the same unit using the same essential questions. So if a parent was challenging, say, one of those books, then they would say, well, then here are three others that still teach the same thing that you could utilize to teach the same, the same topic. And you might remember, if you, did anybody read the book Outsiders when they were in or seen the movie? Very controversial book when it was originally proposed to be taught in high school. Boys out drinking, boys out fighting. Um, there's a lot of uh, class war, there's race war. There's a, a lot happening in that book. Um, what's the other one that we had here? Um, it's... Midnight Library of Poets. No, not the new ones. What's the other old night, one? Night, oh, night, okay, night. night. So you're talking about a book about a concentration camp um, survivor, and there's a lot of death. There's a lot of... Um, <laughs> so books traditionally are very controversial. Right. And, and in those contexts, like, I'm okay with that.
Yeah. Let's not let it go, you know, over here because now, you know, you can you can offend somebody or you can hurt them. I, 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 I can be offended right now whenever I'm drunk. Or I don't care who you are anyway. But you can easily hurt somebody, you know, and, and they might not show. It. And so that's where, like, for me, all the language and, and the way that things are terminated, it, it just, I, I mean, I don't, you know. And, and if these are class F, that's another thing. <laughs> Well, in this particular unit, you would have two older novels that have traditionally been taught to teach the, the unit, um, class and then sets. class sets, okay. and then you would have two new novels being proposed, and a teacher would have the opportunity to say, in this unit, I'm going to use the old novel or the other old novel, or I do want to use the new novel to teach this concept. So we're giving them a, little more, a bigger latitude of choice. Um, some teachers... Perhaps me, I'd say, you know, I'm going to stick with the outsiders. Teach this concept. Uh, if I was a 24-year-old teacher, I might say, you know what? I really gravitate towards the new novel, and I think I would like to, you know, have this discussion with my students. And then it comes to what it sounds like you've had a conversation with Mr. Williams about how do you do that as a teacher? Teachers have always had to wrestle with this question of how you present a work literature or art or, you know, most of what you have just said I agree with. If I look at the TV my children grew up watching it compared to the TV I watched, um, you know, but I think it's always kind of a moving target too and I don't want to digress too much. <coughs> Anybody remember the show MASH? I'll connect it. <coughs> my daughter watched an episode of MASH and I remember MASH is a very progressive show speaking out against the Vietnam War and, and the political times. At the time. I thought it was a pretty progressive show. My daughter watched it and said, so what was this, a show about how to sexually harass women? And I go, huh? And she goes, yeah, all these doctors just sexually harass all the nurses all day, and there's all these jokes, and I guess they're supposed to be funny guys. And I'm like, no, MASH was a very progressive show. Well, it's interesting. Then she went and watched an episode of Archie Bunker, and she watched an episode of Cheers. And we had an interesting discussion about, wow, something that was very progressive at the time. <coughs> now it, 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 we, we bring a different lens to it. So my only point is in agreeing with you that it's a constant moving target, and it's the challenge of being an educator to navigate that space with our students. What we ask of teachers is huge. Yeah, but I, I, I just I wanted to agree with you and, and just use that to give an example of how difficult the teacher's job is as they bring in any work to make a point. You want me to give my example? Yeah, please. So we had talked at one of the campuses about how teachers cover controversial topics, and I gave you the example of the English teachers would know there's a novel called The Place Where the Sea Remembers. And in The Place Where the Sea Remembers, uh, before we cover that, your teachers need to be skillful on addressing controversial topics. So one of the things that I always talk about, and it's not my saying, but it's um, in literature, and I don't know any wise people who don't read, by the way, so, so we, we really need to make sure that our students are reading diverse works. So uh, there's, a, there's a saying that says um, that uh, literature is a, is a rehearsal for life, is an imaginative rehearsal for life. So through literature, students through the mediation of a teacher can entertain these concepts and topics that they would not otherwise encounter in their daily life, but they could do that through literature. So, so I would tell the students, this imaginative rehearsal for life, in this work of fiction, there is a character that is contemplating something that probably goes against a lot of your values, some of your religions, but we're gonna have the opportunity in here to talk about this in a safe place to do that. And you're gonna have an opportunity to go back and talk to your parents about this. And the, in the place where the sea remembers, there was a character that was contemplating abortion. Um, told within a story uh, that she was raped, uh, told within a story that um, she was gonna give up the baby for adoption, um, but that didn't pan through. Um, she was contemplating it. And so while we were 
working through it, and you know, I'm not going to reveal the end. She doesn't do it, but at the it, it, but at the end, you know, before we got to that, the students are are struggling. I just spoiler, yeah. uh, <laughs> read the story, but there's more to the story. Uh, that that while they were having this imaginative rehearsal of this character who's contemplating something that goes against their values, we were able to discuss it. I had parents tell me, "I've the first time I've ever had a chance to talk about." abortion to my child and we're not for abortion, but we were able to talk about it. So training teachers that way to handle controversial topics because a teacher could totally screw up Huck Finn. They could cover it in the first week of school and kids are saying the Edward left and right and then they're in the hallway saying the N word and you're like, why did you teach that novel the first week of school? Like you hadn't even built a relationship with the students and not to discount all, all your valid concerns about vulgarity and all that stuff that doesn't discount that at all. But there is this realism that allows the students to also work that and it is a safe place to realize like we don't say those words we don't do that so that was the topic that we had about literature is an imaginative rehearsal for life um and 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 when it comes to you know controversy when it comes to political things like that um we would welcome those conversations because where else are they going to be able to safely entertain those to diverse opinions. Like, where are they gonna be able to safely talk about what you mentioned if not mediated through literature or a teacher? So that's for the well, benefit of the board. Comment, and I, and I, I truly appreciate you know, every, the conversations we've had because your comment right now, you're saying that you're encouraging them to go home <coughs> and talk to their parents about it because that, to me, um, that's important. And I, and I know when my kids went through the public school system, there, there were topics that they would come, we had an open communication, so the kids would talk to me about things and they'd be like, oh, well, you know, where did that come up? And so they would explain it, and, and we had the conversation. And they knew that they obviously, at some point, they have to make their own decisions. These are what we felt, you know, were our values, but we know that they're individuals. And I think that's the key thing. And also, hopefully, that the, the person in front giving the instruction is, is truly not trying to, it's just, hey, let's have a conversation. This is a crazy world, it's a big world. Uh, we have to get along with people who we don't agree with, um, <coughs> and we have to function. Yeah, and the, these topic these topics are what they are will encounter in life. They're gonna they're gonna graduate at 18 years old, and they're probably not going to be able to avoid uh, depression and suicide and abortion. They're not gonna be able to avoid that. They're gonna experience it. And what better place than in the comfort and safeness of a classroom could they discuss this? But where to Can seek I help for that? Speak to the so. imagined rehearsal he's talking about. Um, you might think if you read Huck Finn in high school that it is, and it is a novel, an anti-slavery novel. But one of the greatest themes in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn is suicide. He says early on in the novel, I was so lonesome I wished I could die. And he makes several references, numerous throughout the novel, of being so depressed that he's suicidal. 
it is a very delicate thing to teach. Kids say, wait, he, he's really contemplating something here when you're the teacher. And you have to be prepared to frame that discussion, have that discussion, do the magic rehearsal Joe's talking about. Well, what do you think this character is going through right now? What's his conflict? Why is he so depressed? What, what are his options? How has he gotten to this place? How does he get out of it? Um, it's, we ask very delicate things of our teachers. We always have. And I want to get back on course here a little. Not that we're off course. I want to applaud you guys. This is exactly the reason you have a study session. Mm -hmm. We're like scholars here, and we're having a very sophisticated debate on really challenging issues. And the board's opinions matter almost more than anyone's. So ultimately, you would be approving books. And I get the weight of that decision. So this is the very purpose of it. These are A starting point was from approved lists. Numerous people have looked about it. We're wrestling. We've been wrestling with these very questions that you're now wrestling with. And we want guidance from the board on what should we continue to wrestle with before we bring the final list to you. Because I guarantee you, we are not the first board or educators to deal with this. And I could mention any book that's been a part of American literature taught in high schools um, has had this debate. Should it be taught? At some point, it had to be approved. And what's the value in teaching it and having these discussions with kids? Um, I, I don't know. Thoughts or other questions or directions? So one of the directions I'm getting to go back to the team, and rather than just the synopsis, do you want a word count or any direct quotes of anything that could be lascivious or sexual in nature or um, curse words? I also heard a request that we pursue um, a dedicated opt-out form. There's a lot of steps. I can't give you a, just an answer to that. Do, if we're going to do that, should we also go back and do that with the older novels? Like if um, a book you might have read when you were in high school is um, All the Boys Trapped on the Island and uh, Lord, of the Lord of the Flies. Okay, right? I think I'm not giving anything away. They end up hunting each other down, Lord of the Flies, and, you know, two. It's a Hobbes Locke debate. Is man basically good or basically evil? They end up killing a boy with a sharp stick. It's pretty graphic. graphic. Mm -hmm. So are we only going to do forms for new proposed, perhaps controversial novel, or should we do the back work? I have another for question. All of them. Yes. So. Well, you have a list of those. Can I speak to that? Okay, I agree with you. Some of the work correlated to this, and um, about two weeks before Christmas break, mm -hmm. I set up a meeting with myself and Mr. Williams, who is involved in libraries, Dr. Hoon is over curriculum, and Dr. McNair, and our head librarian, because there was a book on the shelves, and I, when we looked at it, we agreed, whoa, th this should not be on the shelves. So then it began a debate of, well, who decides what's removed from shelves? We pulled up the board policy. It might be a separate presentation, different than this one, but we could come present to you. There is an actual book challenge that uh, uh, any community member, parent, or teacher, or anyone can make to say, hey, this book's on the shelves or being taught, and it shouldn't be. And, and there's a process outlined in board policy, and we can pull that up and show you. But the reason I put all those people in a room together was to make this comment to them, that if a book is brought forward, and somebody has a concern, it shouldn't be the assistant soup who reads it, and I decide no, yes. It shouldn't be the director of curriculum instruction who makes that decision. Should we give it to the board president and say, should we pull it or not pull it, and then you're the guy because it's your turn now, or, uh, or you prior? So what we began doing was the work of putting together that committee of two, four, five, and we... One of our notes was to perhaps add a parent and a student, and when a book challenge comes forward, that committee would come together and read the book and say, now the book we were looking at, we thought, oh, everyone would pretty much say, let's get this off the shelves, and, and we temporarily pulled it. Um, well, not we, we have pulled it. Um, but 
that's the beginning of some work that I thought was important, that it should be a committee of people deciding because of the nature of the discussion we're having today, it's too weighty a decision to put on any one person. But we do want to clarify that that was not a book that was um, taught in a classroom. It was not. Nor a book that was in any syllabus. It, and so it it's, it's kind of like we're shows. answering two questions at once. So I just want to no, clarify no, really important. quick, Mr. Very Rupp, important. is that part of the question that you asked Mr. Campos and Mr. Garcia was, um, how do we decide like what's taught in the classroom and how do the parents know? And part of that is every um, at the beginning of every school year, teachers send home a syllabus to their students, I mean to their parents, and their parents have to sign off on said syllabus. And so in the discussions of some of the teachers that I've talked to, um, English teachers, they actually list the, the names of the books, the titles, and the, the authors of the books. And under the board's direction, we could expand that to include um, the topics that you all have indicated today so that they know exactly what is in said books. Um, right now, the, the teachers, that when the syllabus that they present to the, the students and to their parents um, is usually just the name of the book and who it's by. Um, the same with film studies, the cinematic classroom. Um, they submit the list of, of movies or, or clips of the movies that the students would watch, and then the parents then approve um, the syllabus or not. One example from last school year, um, Ms. Chavez actually handled it over at Heritage. Um, there was a book in the um, ERWC class, the in, uh, English reading, writing, and let's see. Course. Co course. <laughs> we have so many acronyms. So in that ERWC course, um, there was one text that the parent was not okay with the student um, reading. And so just like we're presenting here, there were a number of novels that the student could choose from that would teach the same material, the same essential questions, the same, um, the same themes. And so um, Ms. Chavez met with a the parent, they talked, they switched out the novel, um, and then she called and said, um, this is the process that I followed, which was exactly right, because that's in our board policy 1312.2 that talks about if a parent decides to um, challenge any of the instructional materials. This is the process that they go through. And the first step is the informal complaint, which goes to the principal. And so that's what was followed, which is why it didn't come to the district level and we were just notified after the fact. So that's what is already happening um, in our, our schools right now based off of the materials that are taught in the particular classroom. And what Mr. Breff is talking about are the library materials which is the separate discussion that we're talking about developing a more robust process for. Um, and we've done research from here all the way to New York, looking at different states, looking at what their process is. We've um, even you know, seen board policies that are upwards to 20 pages um, on this particular topic to detail um, what the form says, um, and how to go about challenging those um, library materials. So we do have a set of board policies in Board Policy 6000 that talks all about, about all about our instructional materials, but then we also have another set of board policies in the 1000s that talks about what we need to do as far as the complaints. And the last time that the board revisited the policy 1312.2 was back in 2006. And so it is something that we have considered and looked at, that it is something that we would be bringing to the board once the team meets again and goes through the process to see exactly what direction are you all providing to us that we need to take in revising this policy. And we've also looked at what the California School Boards Association's recommendations were, um, but we knew that um, bringing the information to you today would help us in our discussions when we meet again. Um, we do have a meeting already on the calendar for January that Mr. Bruff has set for us um, prior to his departure. And out of that discussion came some other concepts of, you know, traditionally librarians from recommended reading lists, Libraries of America or California Department of Education, would order new books. So what's, what are the guidelines for ordering new books? <coughs> what are the guidelines if a book is challenged? Mm -hmm. What are the guidelines for culling books? And by culling, you can imagine going, let's use science, it's easy. You're a librarian, you're going through a, a science book from 1960 on the environment, probably needs to be removed, and we need to order a new book on environmentalism or something, right? Um, you're constantly pulling books. That's a big thing, especially when you're getting into these controversial issues now. And so we thought we should get that committee together to look at how our books ordered, how is that information presented to you as a governing body, how are books reviewed and culled and removed, and then how are book challenges, which is what the, 
originally brought it to our attention and we thought, well, we need a more sophisticated process than the one we currently, shouldn't be like head librarian, make a decision, or director of curriculum, you decide. I don't want to be repetitive now, or board president, or superintendent. Um, we really thought we need a rubric and we're searching for those on how we analyze and answer some of the questions you're bringing to us today. Mm -hmm. Like what is the rubric for, is a book appropriate or not appropriate? And we're, we're looking, so there's a lot of work to answer your questions and we're doing that work. Um, does, this, does that make sense? I'm gonna stop there. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. But I wanna clarify, I'm not looking for an opt out form, I'm looking for an opt in form oh, for participation. Okay. And the reason why I say that is because it gives the parents the authority and the power, which should be anyway, if they approve it or not. You know, before, um, and in regards to us taking a vote in regard to that form pertaining to all the books, I would ask the board for direction. You know, I wouldn't just- we certainly bring various forms to you, opt in, opt out, and yeah, some- Okay, yeah, and as you're, we're having this discussion, it's a study session, I want you to know my team is here taking notes and all the homework, <laughs> thinking, research, uh, we're, we're, that's the purpose of this study session. You're giving us homework, we're gonna go back and do that homework. There may be subsequent study sessions, there may be other ways to give you that information, that, that'll really be under the guidance of our superintendent, but we're here as a study, to study together and begin answering questions you may have as a board. Would the you, very purpose of today. I'm, I'm sorry. Would no, you no, also no. like to see a copy of like a current English syllabus and how parents sign off on that? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> we can provide that. <coughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, do we have any sort of documentation or documented effect, positive or negative, that novels have had on kids? What's the one? This. So Great. we do talk about this a little bit in our ethnic studies component. There is research out of Stanford University School of Education on the power of students seeing themselves in their curriculum. Um, on, on the side note, this is actually part of what my dissertation was on um, and getting feedback from teachers and through, um, on student pieces. And one of the biggest feedback pieces that we got from students was them wanting to see themselves more in the curriculum, including the novels. And it creates a buy-in. Um, I know that you, some of you are in the classroom. My husband's currently in the classroom, and one of the challenges, he's a social science teacher, is getting students bought in and seeing themselves. Um, because teaching things the old way we've learned, coming back from COVID doesn't work, and they tend to really tune out. But when they're able to identify with the characters, um, they're, we got their attention, and that's what we really need to do in order to teach the standards. We use the novels to teach standards, we te and that's what we do, we teach standards. We use textbooks to teach standards. And what we're trying to do as teachers or as educators is in effect engage our students with that curriculum so that we can teach those standards. But overall, if you look at a lot of the research coming out, time and time again, the one strong message from students is they wanna see themselves in that curriculum and people that they can identify with. And so we do that. In terms of novels, we don't teach full novels. We use components of the novel to teach those standards. And that's what um, uh, Mr. Thomas was re referring to previously. We don't just go, here's a novel, go read. I think we did that in the 90s. So it was a shift that happened in the Common Core <laughs> yeah. around 2014. I, that, that's how I got the callus from dialectical <laughs> journals, um, reading all of the full novels over the summer. Um, but we don't do that anymore because there isn't a value of necessarily the full novel, but there is value in terms of going deep within the excerpts. Not to say there's not value in reading novels, but that should be something that typically is done on their own time. And if a kid is engaged and wants to go check out a book from the library, well, that just makes me happy as a former English teacher. Um, Did we answer your question? Sorry. 
I thought she did. <laughs> okay. Much better than I would have, and she's done, so like I said, doctoral work on this. Yeah, yeah. And that, you're referring to the Sherman Alexi novel, I think, that's in there. He's the, he's the famous Native American author. Yeah. The True Diaries of some true Native American. Like for myself, coming from the inner city, I, I don't like to see kids mentally take the Native American in. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see it. I mean, I don't want to take the blame on anybody, but tell the truth. This is what happens. This is what they... Well, I'll bring out a little old English teacher explanation. Uh, um, stories are characters in conflict seeking resolution. So whenever you read a novel, you're going to have characters, and they're wrestling with some conflict. And the novels that tend to pique kids' interest and elicit dialogue and debate and thought are the ones that are engaged in conflict that either your country's dealt with or people deal with or um, so you're going to have some element of violence or some element of decision making you know, these are the things that we literature wrestles with and we could any novel that you read back in high school you could think what was the conflict was it a racial conflict was it a class societal conflict was it a conflict dealing, dealing with mistreatment of you know an underclass I can keep going, think of all the conflict. Um, we're doing in this study session the very hard work of, this is the hard question. Novels and the conflict, which one do we bring to kids and approve, and which one do we shy away from? Ultimately, we as a body are gonna have to approve something and then train teachers to go out and do the intelligent work. I, you're just, I just wanna honor you, you're asking all the hard questions. And we're gathering homework to come back and do some of that thinking and present. You ask this, here's our response. You ask this, here's our response. I kind of like it to, you know, you have young kids. But, you know, so let me take a step in the room. You're the drug runner for that remote because you don't want them to be there too late. Absolutely. And you're flipping that remote. So, uh, I understand we, we don't start these novels till at night, thankfully. Yes, sir. So please know as you express these thoughts, they are writing down notes of work that we need to do to come back to you or answer the thoughts or questions or queries or struggles you might be having as a board. This is not a list of, hey, today, this is what we're proposing, do you approve them? It's a study session to do exactly what we're doing. And that's why I sound a little broken record now because I want to just honor the process. So keep asking the hard questions. We're going to keep writing down our homework and we're going to come dig and come back. Address something that Joan said. Mr. Uh, Thomas said he wanted to address one I just, thing. Uh, you bring up a great point. It was so our, our, our thinking when starting this whole process was diversity and inclusion. And so we were looking at the authors that are on our current novel adoption list, and a very high percentage fit a, 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 a specific um, um, demographic. demographic. Thank you. 
Uh, and so we looked at like what Native American authors are out there, what Latino authors like. How can we represent our, our, our you know, our students? Um, and and what challenges can we bring in to be able to have these great discussions? And also, what can we as teachers do with the curriculum? And one of the most powerful teaching tools is cross curricular instruction. And so with bringing in historical novels, like being able to have those great conversations with the history teachers, allowing to connect with those classes, and allow me as an English teacher to, to, to bring up these ideas in class, and then allow the students to go into their history class and have those same conversations, and really get that, that powerful instruction. Um, and for me as a teacher to be able to, to look at what themes I want to teach you know, within those novels and connect with the history classes and allow that history teacher to continue that theme as well. So that was one of our thinkings as well. Well, that's the problem. Yeah. So think about what he just said, and I'm combining what you're saying and what he's saying. Think about a unit we might have had way back in the day where in a history class, they were teaching Jim Crow. In your literature class, you might teach the play A Raisin in the Sun. You might remember the great Sidney Poitier movie, right? Um, very topical at the time, very controversial at the time. In social studies, you might be teaching Jim Crow. In literature, you'd be teaching uh, either the whole play or a passage from that play. And then maybe kids are doing writing, thinking, and, and argumentation about that concept. What are the concepts today that our students are going to be wrestling with? What is it that should be taught in a social studies class, augmented by a piece of literature in the literature class? And then how, back to your point, I'm cobbling together everything now, do we trust teachers to delicately lead that discussion and, and that thinking? Not, not tell them what to think, but how? And then bring in the internet, and wow, it, this is tough stuff. So you bring in the initial point. So how do we, how do we as a topic study be chosen for this? Are these student-driven topics? Are these parent-driven topics? Because you know, for me, uh, as, as a youngster, I didn't really like reading all the assigned books that I had to read. Yeah. about the same age. So <laughs> to me, it's never been guided by any racial lens or perspective. Now, when, when there was a, a good Mexican ball player that was a baseball player, I, you know, I knew who they called out what it was. You know, I, knew, I knew who they were, but I wasn't like, and I was great to see them succeed, but it, it wasn't about the racial component. Or, and, and I almost think that nowadays, with the diversity, equity, inclusion, it's like we're, we're, we're so forced into that thing and now when you pick that group, you know, this could be the novel that represents that group or represents a former gang member. And so how do we, I guess, get to that? Because I know for me, I, you know, high school math, you know, what I read is what I read, and I don't really care who the author is, what race they are, what, you know, gender, anything. I don't care. I just, hey, if they're someone that, like, hey, I can read that. And I, and I, I prefer, I, I, I guess, I, how do we? I can give you a very standard English answer. We, when we become an English teacher and study literature in college, you wrestle with this. When we look at British literature, it tends to have debates about class. People with land and people who were peasants. Haves and have nots. American literature has traditionally dealt with race as a, a constraint, a question, because it's so much a part of the American experience. And I, I could draw a line for with 100 novels that have moved that racial discussion in America um, because we're not a country based on landed gentry and peasants. Our history is a little different. So our literature deals with our history. It dealt with it in terms of slavery, which is art from Frederick Douglass to Huck Finn to some of those others I talked about, up to To Kill a Mockingbird, and, and now modern books. Um, it also more and more deals with the immigration experience. A lot of our literature is about the immigrant experience of coming from one country to another and becoming American. That's kind of a constant theme in American literature. So 
it's hard to get away from. How you, your question was, how do these get picked? Even baseball, if we were going to bring a, pick a book now, say you tasked us, why don't you do a book on great baseball players? Well, how would you address? Do you not talk about Jackie Robinson? Do you not talk about Roberto Clemente? Do you not talk about people who broke the color barrier in baseball? I don't know. Maybe you don't. Maybe you just talk about batting averages and who had the most hits. But I think if we were, if you tasked us now with pick a book on baseball, <coughs> a literature book in baseball would probably deal with the race issue in some way. It's complicated. But see, if we were going to, what were we proposing to you? We're going to read, have our kids read the autobiography of Jackie Robinson or the biography of Jackie Robinson. I don't think too many people in this room or out in the community or anybody that's sitting up there would be too terrified of Jackie Robinson. Let's go back in time, and it's 1962, and the assistant superintendent of education is before you as a board saying, we're going we're gonna to have our students read the uh, biography of Jackie Robinson. What do you think of that? The people sitting up there would be wrestling with a few things. It's kind of the moment we're always in in America, in American education. You're wrestling. We're wrestling together with you with these questions. What do we approve? What do we not approve? It's hard. We're asking for your guidance, and we're happy to go back and do more homework for you today. That's the purpose of the day. So keep throwing questions at us and homework at us. We will do it and come back. Yes, sir. Do you yeah. mind if I, sure. if I address that? So from, from a teacher's perspective, um, and I'll just, I'm going to use um, the, uh, the example that's on here. And you asked a great question. How, how do we decide, like as teachers, what are we going to teach, right? Um, and so ultimately, I'm just going to use this example because it's the first thing. So for, from a teacher's perspective, my, the way I, I frame lessons is I look at what's valuable for the students to learn inside and outside the class, right? So what's valuable for them? Um, and then what, you know, what do I have, uh, uh, what assets do I have to, to share with the students? And so I looked at the, you know, unit two for uh, chapter 10 from our, our adopted textbook. Um, do people need to belong? Okay, so what's my theme of that unit? It's going to be belonging, identity, you know, culture, and so on. Um, and I'm looking through, and okay, cool. Poet X, if it becomes adopted, Poet X is one of our, our novels. It's a new novel. It's relevant. And I go, okay, as a teacher, I think, all right, I, now I can tie poetry with this. Okay, cool, and, and believe it or not, not all ninth graders like poetry. <laughs> so I think, okay, how can I connect poetry to get them to like it? Okay, songs, music, right, songs. Songs are the most popular form of poetry, awesome. Now I got them connected when I teach poetry with music. And then I go to Poet X, and we don't read the whole novel, we don't need to, right? That's not the purpose of, of this. Um, and so I pull out excerpts of Poet X, and that leads me to poetry slams, performances. Okay, cool, now I can talk about speeches. Now I can get the students up in front of a class. So now I can do an in-class poetry slam. And allow, so going back to poetry, allowing students to be able to voice what they want to talk about, right, through their poetry. Which could be, uh, uh, it could be uh, um, uh, race issues, it could be, uh, it could be whatever issues they're feeling, right? So as a teacher, I'm facilitating what, what my students need. But I'm doing it in a way that, that it, you know, is accessible for all students and allowing the students to voice, guiding them, not what I want to hear from them, but what the students want to say. And so then we do our class poetry slam, right, for the students who want to do it, volunteer only, of course, right, and give them huge rounds of applause. So now I started with, okay, what do I think is valuable for my students to learn? The way to be able to share their ideas, right? And then it leads to poetry, performance, going to the different various texts, whatever we need to choose, getting the experience of reviewing the novel, allowing the students to be able to share what they feel they need to get out of the curriculum, not just me presenting what I feel. Um, thank you. Yes, sir. Frank and I, we sat on many poetry slams over at CMI. Yeah. And a lot of the subject matter was about what was going on with them yeah. at home. Yeah. Sure. So question, Thank you. part of when you plan a lesson, and this is almost a lesson, a study session with you all, is you don't always know where that lesson's going. That was the reason for the break, and us come back and answer questions. We can return to sort of the presentation mode 
or we gave the break so you could look over the list and now you're giving us some homework and asking great questions. Do you want us to get back to presenting? Do you have further questions or want to be cognizant of the time but also respectful of your wishes and does that make sense? So I'm trying to think where we would be. So we're going to, um, we're going to skip over the theme statements because we <laughs> talked a lot about the novels and the theme statements and the carousel. Um, in your packet, there was an activity that we did with the students, um, the beginning part of that activity. So we're going to skip through this part where um, we actually took some quotes from the books um, that were the themes. We had the students get into groups that were not with um teams from their schools, um, and we had them look at the theme statement. So we're going to skip this particular activity. But what I do want to go to is just kind of where we've been on this journey and then kind of what the students say. So you know what these Legos are over here in the corner, <laughs> and then our teachers behind us that are going to share a little bit more. So um, with the novels, we have previewed them um, over the summer with our leadership team um, because, again, as Mr. Thomas was talking about, um, we did not include administrators in this process of choosing novels. Um, I think I attended two of the novel committee meetings, maybe for about 15 minutes each, because we wanted to ensure that it was teacher voice and teacher driven. Um, and so um, Director Zerold um, oversaw most of those meetings um, with the, the teachers on special assignment, but it was driven directly um, by our teachers. And we did have the board presentations um, in May and in June, just kind of letting you know that it was coming. Um, we then presented it to the principals because our principals, they were like, everyone knows about these novels, well, what about us? And so we presented it to the principals and then at October Professional Development, um, a part of the Equity is Caring in Action session, um, we had all of the novels out on display um, so that everyone could kind of take a look at what we were considering um, so that they knew that they were coming. Um, another component of this journey that was very, very important was the parent journey. Um, when, when we presented uh, Director Zero and I to you all in June, we talked about putting together a committee that would um, allow, t allow us um, to have some additional information. We do have, you know, under LCAP goal number three um, that talks about parent and community engagement. We talk a lot about our PELI program um, that is led by um, Director Martin. Um, we have our ELAC, we have our DLAC, we have our APACs, we have our DAPACs. Um, so we have a variety of parent committees, but many of those committees don't talk about some of these issues that you all are bringing up today. And so when we presented in June, we said that we would put together um, a committee that would be primarily to talk about these controversial issues and the things that are really concerning our schools, like why aren't our students coming to school, um, looking at our MTSS program, and just providing us with some on the ground feedback from the parents. And so we sent out a letter, um, and we can provide you with a copy of that if you haven't seen it yet. We put it out on Peach Jar, we put it on social media, it was on our school message, message boards like Blackboard. Um, and then the committee submitted applications via this um, interest form. It was in English and Spanish. Um, and so then, um, as Mr. Bruff talked about at the very beginning of this presentation, is that we broke the equity team into three subcommittees. And in that parent subcommittees, they reviewed the applications of the parents who said they wanted to be a part. And so as you can see, these are the demographics of the parents that responded to um, the call for being a part of this committee. Um, as you can see, the committee decided that they were gonna accept up to five parents per school. And we thought it was just like crazy that Liberty High School submitted exactly the, those five applications. Um, we probably would have accepted Liberty if they would have, um, if there were more parents that applied from that school, only because, as you can see from the other schools, some of the representation wasn't as high. We did extend the application process a little longer just because we wanted to ensure that everyone had the opportunity to be a part. Um, we even did a call, you know, at some of the parent meetings that were happening saying, hey, there's this new committee that's forming that's gonna talk about these issues and review the novels and review ethnic studies and review um, our MTSS program and we want your feedback. And so we also asked them in that same um, application um, or interest form, what other committees have they served in in the past? And so as you can see, um, there were nine parents in this committee that have also served in our um, 
on our parent engagement leadership um, initiative, um, as well as schools like council. Some have had no involvement. Some were community members. And so it was just a like a, a broad like fishing of just wanting parents to come um, together to review the information. So what you've seen so far today with the novels and the introduce the authors, um, that is what our parents have seen already. Um, they've seen the, the list of novels. Um, they have also been able to request a copy of the novels um, provided by the school district at our meeting in December. Um, they were also provided with the information that you will see in the second part of our meeting today on ethnic studies. Um, but the parents were provided with everything that you've seen today um, just so that they could see um, and have a voice. And our next meeting um, is coming up with the parents on January the 9th. Um, the meetings are held via Zoom. Um, this is by the parents' preference. Um, we asked them, do you want to meet in person? Do you want to meet online? Do you want a hybrid? Um, almost unanimously, they were saying, can we do it on Zoom? And so we did it on Zoom so that it's accessible to the parents. Um, the meetings were also translated. Um, the parent engagement specialists were involved in the process as well. So that's what we did on the parent side as it relates to these novels as well as ethnic studies. Um, also with our students on the student's journey, um, we've had three um, superintendent listening sessions so far. Um, these are the topics that our students have reviewed. And again, um, in May, it was a very um, broad overview in May. Um, and so we didn't um, consider that we needed parent permission slips because at the time we weren't talking about novels and we weren't really getting into the nitty gritty of ethnic studies. Um, of course, they had to have a field trip permission slip, but as far as the detailed topics, um, we did not send that in May. However, uh, Mr. Bennett and Mr. Bruff and I, um, as we were asking questions that were really general, our students began bringing up topics that we looked at each other and, and we said, we didn't ask those questions. Um, we, we were, they were giving us information that we had no idea that they would bring up, especially as it related to the accountability matrix, which is our, um, it's what we used to call the discipline matrix back in the day. Um, and so when we brought them the accountability matrix, they were bringing up topics of things that were happening um, on their campuses that we said, oh, we probably need to go and ensure that our parents know what our students are bringing up because we weren't prepared at the time. Um, we were asking very general questions about their school experience um, as it relates to discipline and as it relates to, we have all of these new people coming on for our new MTSS program, what do you think about it? And then they created public service announcements as it related to how they would want it rolled out on their campuses and the like. So that was the activity of the first day. We then came back and not only with the filter permission slip, but we included an additional permission slip that had the topics of the novels and had the topics of the ethnic studies and sort of where the equity team was going with these particular topics. We ended that second day with an attendance challenge by asking our students, why do students come to school? Why don't they come to school? And what can we do to ensure that they come to school? And so we did that in September and with Director Marvin Atkins, we wanted to ensure that we heard from the students not only like let's talk about novels and ethnic studies, but what is making you engage um, in the academic tasks that you're presented with? You know, what is, what is your experience like on your campuses? And so we did that as a team in September. In November, By the way, can I include sure. one, thing? one of the overwhelming responses was, can you bring us some books that we can relate to? <laughs> uh, yeah, but that's hard. The process we're engaged in. Total process. And so because they asked that when we just introduced the top, the names of the books at the September meeting, um, our two uh, teachers on special assignment, um, Mr. Thomas and Ms. Harris, they put together a full like immersive experience for our students with novels. Um, they chose, I believe it was nine novels, Mr. Thomas? Eight. Eight novels where the students were partnered in groups um, and they went through eight of the novels that are on the um, novels under review list. Um, and they um, started engaging in the themes, they started engaging in the summaries, they started having conversations. What was really interesting is that some of the students were saying, oh, I've read this book before. Oh, my sister read this book. And so then the conversation um, 
became a little richer. And so what you'll see in your um, novel summary um, packet is the activity that we took the students through as it relates to novels. We then had them do one of the performance tasks in ethnic studies. And when we get to the ethnic studies portion of the meeting, um, we'll talk about what those performance tasks look like. Um, and you'll see a sample video, TikTok video, from Heritage High School students. Um, but we also had the students do a building block activity with their reactions from the, um, from the book. So now I will have uh, Ms. Wakefield, who's a teacher at um, CMI, and also Mr. Thomas. I'll call them back up. end of our uh, superintendent listening session, we had, we had done throughout the session a theme activity um, where students were able to read themes from the books um, and then give their thoughts and perspectives of it from their, from their personal perspective. Right? And then we had all 23 novels around the room and one sentence theme statements that were either directly from the novel or represent the theme of the novel throughout. So students were able to look at each 23 novels look at a statement that represents the novel or taken directly from the novel and, and decide, like, what, find one that connects with them really well. And so what they did was at the end of the session, they took a block, a Lego block there, wrote down the theme that connected with the students really well, the one that was like, this is me, like that, the, the book was written for me. Wrote that down. I would, perfect, thank you. And then, no, that's perfect, thank you. All I, all I saw was Legos Everybody everywhere. Was for yeah. yes. And then um, they wrote down the theme, and then the students had the option to choose if they wanted to write down why it connected to them or not, because I, we wanted to give them the choice. Because sometimes things connect to us, and we're just not ready to talk about them yet. We're not ready to talk about why. So they wrote that down. You'll see some have it, some don't. And then we connected it. Or we're just bringing them closer. No, that's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> what good teachers we have. <laughs> and you'll see that, you know, the, 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 as an English teacher, I love metaphors. And so we have our metaphors of, you know, the different bricks, the different colors, the different sizes, the different backgrounds, yet they all get put together in unity, right? Representing our students in our district. So that's our, our student block activity. The students really enjoyed that a lot. Ms. Wakefield? Yeah, and I'll just say, speaking to some of the conversation we've already had, some of the motifs that students brought forth, as you can see, there are self-doubt, um, learning from past experiences, and those things exist within the novels we've currently adopted, but there is such a distance in terms of historical relevancy that as teachers, we have to spend so much time front-loading and giving them that historical context, giving them... Um, definitions for somewhat obsolete and esoteric language and diction and syntax. So by using these new novels as a parallel, it just allows us to hit those, you know, more in depth of knowledge questions and conversations that um, allow them to build those synopses in their brain and realize that those books that we are reading, such as Lord of the Flies and Night, paired with the poet X, um, they have these underlying motifs. And so, um, again, just speaking to those are parallels, these are extensions of what we're already doing just to foster those um, learning experiences. Okay. So as you can see, these are this, our students' words um, that they have. Um, we didn't give them, like, this is what you should put on your block. Um, many of them, it just says, connect with, that's all we started with, and then they could choose whatever text that they connected with. So would you like me to pass it to you around, or are you all good? <coughs> it's, it's in print, but um, the, the picture is probably not as clear, but if you want to take a little bit of a pause, you can see that. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no, it's just, we're just... They come right apart. Oh, okay. 
conditions that are the same. We're not all in her direction. you pass this either, but we can certainly type them up and, and provide them. Maybe my, the weekly summary, I can attach that for you. Does that work? Okay. We'll do that for you. We wanted you to see the work of the students of the community. They have been exciting experiences in a leader classroom for the day, but what our teachers on special assignment um, and um, our superintendent and our administrative advocates have allowed us to do is to build a, a classroom of students. Um, this superintendent building assessment is not made up of students that um, are just all of our A students. This, this group is a group of students where the administrators were able to choose a special education student, um, a student that's gotten into trouble um, at some time, an English learner, um, an ASB student, an athlete, and then also a student that participates in some of our special programming, like our advanced placement programming, or a student that has like really, really um, good grades. Mr. Bennett? And the, the student, one student from Paris Lake High School, she, she was just amazing. And she was so well-spoken, was a leader in the group, but had come from Paris Lake. And I said to her, how did you end up at Paris Lake? Because she was just so vibrant and and she said, I, I'm, I messed up and I'm having to fix it. But, but she was like a, the biggest leader in the group, I think. She was. Her name is Olivia. And Olivia is, um, she is super sweet. And she talks about her experience at Heritage High School and how she, you know, messed up her experience there. But how she is doing everything that she can do to overcome um, all of the barriers. And how the people at Paris, like the staff, the students, the um, just anyone on campus is just such a listening ear for her. Um, and so it provides us with like a both and experience where we're not able, we're not only presenting information to them, but we're learning from them so much um, because they're really talking about the true experiences of what's happening on the campuses. And when I visit Paris Lake, um, Olivia is like, Dr. McNair, look what we've done. And so they're bringing back their experiences and they're telling their friends about that they do listen to us is what they've said is we do have a voice at the table and, and they are taking notes when we talk. And, and then also, you know, Olivia's experience is talking to the other students in the room and she's quick to say, don't do what I did. Like, let's make sure you keep, you know, keep it together so that you can stay at your school. And so it's just a really good um, group of students. And so um, if you're available, if you want to like <laughs> pop in, um, our next superintendent's listening session is coming up in March, um, I believe. And so we would love to, um, to have you stop by just to see these amazing students that are participating. Sure. Thank you, Anna. Um, we would love to, to have you because it's just, it's such a unique experience that we're able to take the initiatives of the district and have them talk to us about what their real experiences are um, that's different from a classroom setting, but also still structured um, to give them that academic rigor um, that we would want to see. They do. But the main thing I get from students at Paris Lake is a lot of times it doesn't click until they start approaching graduation and they become seniors. I, I know their credit uh, requirements are low, but they all of a sudden they get serious and they realize I have to go out there into the world and deal with things. At their age, it's some of the kids that have a lot of difficulty. Right. For sure, and it's really just nice to hear from them. Um, and the other cool thing about this group is that we just don't focus on our 12th graders. 
um, we have all the grades there because it's important for them to hear from the experiences of their fellow classmen at the different levels so that we can again inspire them. And the reason why Mr. Bennett and Mr. Bruff and I wanted to ensure that the group wasn't just um, like the high performing students was because that's not the voice of all of our students. Um, when we talk about like diversity, we also look at the diversity of experience. It's not just about race or, or gender, but it's like, what are our students experiencing and how can we get all the grade levels involved? Our Pinacati students come for a little bit. Um, they don't have the opportunity to stay the whole day um, because of their school day um, starting earlier and ending earlier. And so it's nice for them also to hear um, about the different experiences that are, of course, age appropriate, but at the same time, give them the opportunity to hear like, oh, I'm going to this high school and this is a, a friend or a connection that I can have at the high school that I'm going to. Any questions about the superintendent's listening session and how we engaged our, or how we engaged our parents or our students? You're welcome. Okay, perfect. Thank you. We have two more left this year, um, and it is, it's probably like the highlight of my month. I can tell you the truth. Like it's, it's just the like the day you don't want to miss ever. And so that kind of concludes the novel portion. I think it was like 9.1. Um, and so if we're going to transition into 9.2, um, which is our um, ethnic studies. And so you have a separate packet on ethnic studies. May I ask one question before sure. you do that? Um, that was a lot, which is it good was. because you guys are really asking the hard questions. And I, again, want to reiterate, we've gathered some homework to do. At some point, we'll be doing other updates or bringing you a list to approve or deny. Um, is there any last bit of homework that you would like us to do? Is there any, um, and then secondly, it's a big pivot now to the ethnic studies class. Do you want to take a 10 minute break or so um, before we jump into that next topic? Do you want to continue? Okay. So are we going to take a break or just one more before we step out? Okay, we'll go. Okay. okay. Any last questions or informational things you want us to pursue as we continue down this journey? Just okay. No, this has been really, really informative for us because we, we've had a list, and I can, you know, show you the extensive uh, drive, shared drive that we've created for novels. It probably has upwards to 20-something documents that the teachers have worked on. Um, and that they've archived well before my arrival here. Um, and so the team has worked really, really hard um, with the novels. And so we wanted to ensure that um, the information that you're requesting, most of it, thankfully, we already have. But it's always that dance of like, so how much information is too much information? And so we will definitely add that um, information that you've requested to those forms and get them back to you. Yes, you're welcome. We're probably about 18 months into the process of both novels and ethnic studies to give you the timeline of kind of where we've been with um, getting both of these two things together. Okay. All right, so we're going to switch gears to ethnic studies curriculum, and I'm going to um, call up Dr. Tomasian. Hey. Good morning, everybody. No, afternoon. It's now afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so like Dr. McNair said, we're pivoting now to talk about the ethnic studies course. Um, so I'm going to be introducing kind of the process that our team looked at when we created the, the curriculum, um, how it really is teacher driven and teacher created. Um, and then at the end of this session, you'll hear more about how it aligns to um, the state civic seal of engagement. There we go. Um, so Assembly Bill 101 was passed in October of 2021. Um, it was actually authored by Assemblyman Jose Medina, uh, right here from Riverside County. So there's a local connection there. Um, and this Assembly Bill modified the state requirement for graduation standards. Um, and so it in, you know, imparts on all districts across the state that in order to graduate with a high school from the state of California, students need to have at least one semester of a course in ethnic studies. 
Commons. Um, that requirement goes into effect for the class of 2023. Um, and so you want to say, like, whoa, well, 2023, or sorry, 2030, that's a long way out. Why are we here in 2023 talking about a class of 2030? The assembly bill also states that it has to be implemented in high schools at least by the year 2526. Um, you know, kind of in some forethought, we would like an opportunity to have a pilot. All good things are piloted and then adjusted, right? Um, and so that's why we're here now in 20, start of 2024 um, to talk about this course. Um, the assembly bill goes into legislation that the course and the curriculum should draw attention to what are traditionally four ethnic and racial groups whose histories have been traditionally overlooked, uh, that being African American, Latino, Native American, and Asian American. Um, the interesting thing about the Assembly Bill is that it also calls on districts to really look at their own local context and encourages districts to include that local context, that local heritage, the local ethnicities, the local stories from within our own community. Um, Assembly Bill 101 talks a lot and is all about ethnic studies. Nowhere in the Assembly Bill does it mention the term critical race theory, and so I really think it's important that we stay focused on the ethnic studies curriculum. It is not critical race theory. Um, the state gives a model curricular framework. There's a link on it there, which I think you have. It is hundreds of pages long. The interesting thing about it is that it does not provide any approved instructional materials. It really tasks us as a, as a, as a district to create those instructional materials. And you hear my, my colleagues behind me kind of snicker because that's what they've been doing for the past you know 18 months, is really looking into what are the lesson plans that we are going to include in our course as a district? Um, what's important for our students here? What are our teachers wanting as um, um, you know, instructional tools and materials to really delve into the topic of ethnic studies. Um, so I'm going to kick it off to my colleague, Dr. Cahoon, to take us from there. All right. So the question came up of what will ethnic studies do and what will it not do? Ethnic studies is meant to engage students in critical thinking and analysis um, and create an environment of inclusivity and identifying commonalities between groups. It's meant to build up the community. It's meant to affirm students. It's not meant to be de divisive. It's not meant to place blame. It's not um, teaching children or students what to think, but it's providing with the tools on how to engage in those critical thinking strategies. and. Um, uh, when we're presented with information. So if you think about current context, it's, it's being able to engage in civil discourse um, using academics um, as their foundational component. Um, the course implementation, this kind of gives you a guideline of where it started. This started bef uh, before I arrived in the district. Um, oh, I was this looks a little familiar to our, old, our here. You, you saw this way back before fall of Yes, we're in yellow right now. We're in yellow. <laughs> um, right now, um, the, the idea is to keep in mind is that the um, way that this was developed is it was divided into three groups. We had the parent group, the student group, and then the curriculum, which was based off of the staff and the teachers. This was teacher developed. Um, and it was uh, taking in all voices. There was a lot of detailed um, research that went into creating the units that my colleagues are going to share with you. Um, a lot of local connections were made. Um, a lot of professional development was had. Um, and what it did is it kept, um, it heard the needs and the desires of all educational partners when putting together um, the units that you're gonna be privy to. Um, there's input here. Um, on the curriculum development and design, it's also been tested, as Dr. McNair um, talked uh, to you about, um, through some of the um, some of the, the um, performance tasks we we went through with students as well. Um, the way that the, the content itself was developed is that there, the team sat according to the pillars, and um, one of my colleagues has introduced how those pillars worked. But they spent full days putting together what would be taught how this could be taught and making sure that it was relevant to, uh, for the 21st century for our students. <clears throat> okay. no, 
I'm filling in for uh, Mr. Alfred. He had another um, obligation. Um, and so Mr. Alfred um, has been a part of the equity team um, for the last six years. Um, and so about six years ago, the team went through a navigating differences training um, under the leadership of Dr. Charles Newman, who was the assistant superintendent at the time. Um, and so under his direction, the, it was a team of teachers between six and eight. Um, they started on this journey of just building capacity um, within the, the leadership of the district, the teacher leadership. Um, following that, um, at the beginning of last school year, um, Dr. White, who is the former county superintendent of schools for Riverside, um, came in and did an, a training on the third option. And so she spent time prior to my arrival um, here to focus on similarities when talking about race and really, really focusing on the message, oops, uh, the message of unity. Um, from then, um, in January, when I arrived in 2023, um, we started talking about culturally relevant pedagogy and just cultural relevance as it relates to um, what do our students and our teachers need to know before um, approaching a topic like this. We've talked about this earlier today that um, you can't um, present a topic without the proper framing, the proper structure, the proper information. And so we spent about six months just talking about what are the things that teachers need to know prior to having this conversation? Because at the time, we weren't sure which grade level or which subject matter credential area that is teacher would teach this course. Right now, there currently isn't a ethnic studies um, credential. Um, there is talks of an ethnic studies credential, um, but right now one doesn't exist. Um, then we also expanded the team to include all of the divisions in the organization because we felt as if, um, if it was only teachers at the table, then um, everyone doesn't take ownership of the information. And so that's when all of the divisions got involved um, with the committee. So the committee grew from about eight to 12 um, until a little over 30 people. And those meetings are monthly, um, which we developed the subcommittees, which you saw on the second slide, that has a list of all of the people um, in on each of the subcommittees. Um, last year, a few of the members went to the Footsteps of Freedom study tour um, just to provide some additional historical context. Um, we will have an, um, an additional tour upcoming in June for some of the pilot teachers, again, to build additional capacity. Um, a few of our teachers have been meeting with historians from the Western History Association um, just to provide us with some feedback of just kind of where we were thinking. Because one of the things we didn't want to do is present something that lacked historical um, accuracy. And so um, we also had, um, I think one of you, um, I think, believe it was you, Mr. Compost mentioned, you know, going to an Indian reservation. And so there are, Mr. Stafford, thank you. There was the talk of, you know, going to visit the Sherman Indian School and what does that look like? And so some of our teachers actually, we, we paid for them to go to the Sherman Indian School. We paid for them to go to the Cheech Museum in, in Riverside, the Civil Rights Museum in Riverside, just to see in our local context, what do we have with, to, with, at our disposal, but then how can we align what we wanna do with the state's requirements? Again, an unfunded mandate from the state of California without um, any approved instructional materials because there is not a ethnic studies book, textbook that has been vetted by the state. There are sources that we've picked from like um, Dr. Cahoon um, and the Tosas and I, we've been reading a book called Rethinking Ethnic Studies and it contains you know, articles and artifacts of things that people have done over the, over the years of ethnic studies. And so um, one of our teachers, Ms. Um, Alvarado, uh, Kelly Alvarado from Paloma, she actually presented our uh, portions of our course to some historians at the Western History Association in October to get feedback on um, from those um, historians. And they were completely impressed with some of the things that our teachers came up with. Um, we also had some a group of teachers with Dr. Cahoon go to a Creating Civically Engaged Students Aligning Ethnic Studies and the Civic Steel of Seal of Engagement. Oh, that should say seal, not steel. Um, just caught that typo. Um, and so in that way, um, we found out how to ensure that our students were able to um, obtain a seal in the way that we set it up. Um, the last thing that our team has done is a few of us have been a part of the 21st Century School Leadership Academy, um, which is run by um, the Los Angeles um, Educational Partnership, the LAEP, where, again, it's a capacity building um, consortium that allows us to come back 
to those monthly committee meetings. So all of these little things, like the last four bullet points, are smaller groups of teachers, but their responsibility is to go to um, like the conferences, like the RCOE Excellence Through Equity, the San Diego County Equity Conference, and really bring that information back to the team to infuse that information. So as we are building um, the training for our teachers and our and um, a lot of uh, base work for our, our students, that it's not just what we think or what we heard, but it's actually true historical fact based off of our particular area. Um, I remember being on a Zoom with one of the historians from the Western History Association, and he said, did you all know about the Temecula Massacre? And then he provided us all of this information about the Temecula Massacre back in the 1800s that many of us on the call had never heard of. And so that's the kind of context that the historians are bringing in of what has happened in the neighborhoods that our students currently live in now that they should know about their neighborhoods. And so that's just been something that's really been vital to, to our success in the, in the program. Uh, Mr. Salcedo, I'm calling him up. He is a social science teacher at Paris High School who also teaches a Latin American history class. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, long process, right? Um, a little background about myself. Um, I was born and raised in Paris. Um, I've been here all my life. My parents came here in 62. Um, all my parents, sorry, all my brothers and siblings out of 10 of us um, graduate from Paris High School. So um, as I grew up in Paris, uh, we didn't have anything like this. And um, I wish we did, because I would have um, taken a lot of better steps in my life, similar to the board member here, Mr. Steve Campos. Um, some of the overview ethnic studies, uh, we have modules here is identify self-awareness. And um, module two, history movements and community. Module three, systems of power and injustices. And module four, social movements, um, equity and action. Uh, module one, I'm gonna get to that in the next slide, but module one, teaching Latin American, American studies, Latin American studies classes, um, we deal with all four of these pillars in a sense, one, one way or another. For example, uh, Native Americans, African Americans, Latinos or Latinas, Asian Americans, Pacific Honors, and Middle Easterners. For example, segregation. We think of segregation only as African American um, experience as a historian. But segregation goes way back there. If you guys know Mendes case, Westminster, Minister Westminster case, this was a little Latina girl in Orange County who was prevented to go to an Orange County school uh, because she because of her race. And segregation prevented her to get that higher education or that education. Her parents uh, fought pretty hard for that. Um, so segregation it's, has overlapping of the four pillars. For example, Asian Americans. What does that have to do with segregation? Well, there's a family um, basically who helped, who were put in concentration camp, Holocaust, sorry. Um, they were, <laughs> I love that. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. I didn't change that. Um, the Mendes family, um, basically, they were put in these camps, and during World War II, uh, because they're put in camps, um, they didn't have the opportunity to uh, use their land. So the Mendes family used those lands, and what, what the bigger picture is, that helped the Brown versus Board education to end segregation in all, th all throughout the United States. So. These things build on upon each other, and it's not just Latinos or Native Americans or just Africans. It's all interwined because segregation has hit almost all four major of these groups. Does that make sense, kind of? I'm going to go down to the next. Um, click this here because I don't present too much here. Um, the next one we have here is Module 1. Module 1 will have all three of these components, a set of questions, learning objectives, performance tasks. For example, if you go into, uh, I'm just gonna click on this one because I thought it was very interesting. I don't know, okay. So this one here, if you look at it, and you guys can look at it um, your own time. Go ahead. Okay. Um, assignments, and you have objectives and to encourage students to explore, reflect their own culture, backgrounds, and traditional values, and share the understandings of their peers. I'm gonna stop there. I have a young lady who I uh, took my class. Nobody in her family has been educated. Her grandparents don't know much about you know, writing their first name. Um, similar to a lot of Latino families. For example, my dad went to one grade. My mom, one grade. Um, 
I don't come from a background of educated people. I don't have that um, opportunity. But because she found herself, she found herself uh, this identity. She found herself in this um, traditional values, and she found her, her culture. She bought into education. And I remember talking to her after class. She came to me all excited. She said, Salcedo, I think I know what I want to do. I understand who I am, and I never before I found myself. Now I want to go to college. And these experiences, um, teaching classes like this, it's, to me, it's worth it. It's worth um, basically helping kids out, and it's worth um, being a teacher because it's not about the money. It's about that experience when a kid finds themselves and they know they want to go to school. So this is just a one module that they ha we have. Um, my peer, Donna, will basically, Donna Good will talk some more about the next uh, module. So I believe I'm finished. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Salcedo. Come on, Donna. Ms. Good is a Spanish teacher as well as um, avid teacher at Paris High School. There you go. Okay. So good afternoon. Once again, my name is Donna Good. I teach Spanish and AVID at Paris High School. And um, just to um, make some additional references to how we built this curriculum, one of the things that we really wanted to do is we wanted to make this curriculum to be not static but evolving. So one of the um, collaborations we've made is with the Civil Rights Institute in Riverside, 10 minutes from my house. and they give us, each time they have a new presentation, they have resources and documents that they can they give us that we can use in the class. So if you, when you guys look over the curriculum, the last one they did were African American um, icons and trailblazers in Riverside. When we went to see this, I was like, I know you, I know you, I went to church with you, I know you. Little Richard used to live down the street from me, come talk to me and my mom. I mean, literally, it was my life story. And that hit me so hard, because it was the first time in my life I saw my life story valued like that. And I said, imagine what happens with our kids. The next presentation that's going to be open is uh, next week, and it's going to be the story of farm workers in, in Coachella. So every time they have a new exhibit, because they have, based on an educational grant, they're going to work with us. So every year, our curriculum will continue to grow. It won't be one set stories, but it will be the ongoing story of the history and the unwritten and unacknowledged accomplishments and challenges that our communities have faced throughout the years through ethnic studies. Uh, the other thing is, we didn't want to just make this an essay written class, right? You got English for essays, you got science for essays. We wanted this to be project-based learning, so the students are interacting, but we also wanted the kids to learn soft skills, like empathy, like communication, like problem solving without having to go fisticuffs, learning how to reflect, learning how to accept a different opinion. Those are the type of things we wanted to do. So we really have pushed away from that and made it project based. So with this land acknowledgement, we have a couple videos to show you. What is land acknowledgement and examples of it that I'll have for you to look at. And the important thing about this is, as an avid teacher, each year we take students freshmen and seniors mostly, to Cal State San Bernardino. And before they start the tour, they always do a land acknowledgement. And outside the Civil Rights Institute is a plaque of a, of a land acknowledgement. So this is real, to understand that America wasn't discovered, because someone doesn't discover my house. I'm there. And now to give that acknowledgement, that, that enlightenment to our kids, and to give that restoration for those who have felt ignored is part of the power of what we want to bring to this class. So here's our first video. Before I begin this, this morning, I'd like to recognize the Algonquin Nation on whose traditional territory we are gathering. We acknowledge them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Wherever I go on God's green earth, I do the Lakota tradition of acknowledging the four directions, the land, uh, and the people living there. Unchimaka, as I call the grandmother earth, the land, I view her as a, a sacred, you know, living entity. And that's the way we acknowledge it in, you know, Lakota thought philosophy. 
as a native person, I'm ready for any kind of confrontation that might come up, or I'm preparing myself to remind people of all those things that they forget about. I was at a meeting in Minneapolis, and the room was primarily non-native people. I was in a non-native organization, but this executive director got up and said, okay, we're gonna get started. So everybody you know, was sitting down and getting quiet, and she said, I'd like to get started by acknowledging the indigenous culture of this, of Minnesota. And I was like, first, I was like, wow. And it just made everything like fall away a little bit for me. My guard went down, I was more relaxed. Because by saying that, like, that means she understands something that is just like, you can't talk about, right? There's just, it just relaxed me as a minority, as a woman and as a native person, like it just, like, like pulled away this layer that's always there, you know. It was super cool. We're at a, we're at a time where um, non-native cultures are understanding the traditions of indigenous peoples for for probably the first time in our histories. So, like when I go to New Zealand, the protocol is to acknowledge each other's ancestors and your mountains and your rivers, and 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 that's such a beautiful tradition. When people are in that space and say, we acknowledge who you are, this land, the, where your people come from, they're saying, we acknowledge a relationship, but we're also creating that relationship. So this is a good thing. The important thing would be that <laughs> folks would then sit with that. Like, what does it mean that our settlement is occupying this space? And what responsibility do, do I have considering that legacy to these contemporary Things, right and how do I stop distancing myself from that ideally that would be for me the impact that this has if you start acknowledging that the land that you're standing on and the space that you are in belong to people that are still here like make so much more room for understanding of all these other issues it's one of those little things that like if it could just tip a little bit all the like dominoes that could fall from it I think are important. Now I'm like imagining it and like wanting to live in that like <laughs> the thing that I'm imagining like yeah that's actually really beautiful. It's just being a genuine human being to acknowledge each other's histories, um, the good and the bad. Okay, and then what we are going to do is present for you an um, example of what a land acknowledgement looks like, as well as examples of what we did as a curriculum committee of creating ethnic, uh, excuse me, land acknowledgement statements for us here in the district. Stanford sits on the ancestral lands of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. So that example was from Stanford University. And the examples that we have from our committee is we acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the Coahuila people. I want to respectfully acknowledge the Coahuila people who have been guardians of this lands. And we would like to respectfully acknowledge the native people who have stewarded this land. So with these acknowledgments, what we are trying to get students to do is to really learn to be civic citizens that this class will help them become members of their community who will take action to change and improve the community around them. And when you feel like you belong, when you recognize yourself and see yourself, it inspires you to become involved and it inspires you to participate. So I'm allow you to see these 
examples, and in your packets, you have the um, information so that you can do a land recognition statement for yourselves, where you were born, where you live, wherever you choose to do. As we're passing that out, I want to tie together a few things. If you think about where Dr. Tomasin began, that the state didn't give any parameters for how this course should be taught, there are a lot of fears that this is CRT and it's not. This is an example of a choice where you're honoring people, making them appreciate their history, where they're from. There is nothing in this lesson criticizing white settlers or white people or they came and stole the land. That's not the language here. It's acknowledging people's values, where they come from, where they are. You might wonder, why did we slow down on this particular assignment? It's emblematic of the approach that the teachers took in this course that they're not coming at any of these assignments or these units from a place of criticism <coughs> or division. I know Dr. Uh, Cahoon mentioned that. It's really about honoring our students and the diversity they bring. And it's really trying to be positive as they discuss diversity through this course. Does that make <coughs> sense why I stopped and said that here? You might wonder, well, why so much time on the landing on me? It's an example of the kind of lesson that would happen, but it's not about being divisive or historical guilt or there are bad people and good people. It's just honoring a historical fact and trying to welcome people and recognize the diversity that, that's present. Does that make sense? All right, for the sake of time, we, want, we will not do this entire activity, and so you have the packet that has all the information. And so the next person that I'm going to call to um, the podium is uh, Ms. Wakefield to come back up um, because she was, again, very, very instrumental in helping the teachers put the modules together. Yes. Um, it's a possible lesson. So um, you will have the opportunity to review the full course. It's probably about 40-something pages because the teachers have spent time um, breaking down the modules into some of the lessons. What we've listed here under performance tasks are some of the final activities that the teachers could utilize in order to teach the essential questions. So kind of going back to how the novels are structured, we teach standards um, and we utilize novels to teach the standards. It's the same thing is that we're using these performance tasks to help us to achieve the learning objectives as well as answer the essential questions for each of the, um, of the modules. Um, and so to answer your question more specifically to the land acknowledgement, it is one of the performance tasks that is listed um, inside of the lessons, but it is not anything that we're asking the board to do as a governing body. No, you're welcome. Um, and I would say one more thing about the culture box activity that Mr. Um, Saucedo was talking about. Um, have you ever did that, um, that uh, uh, identity project at the beginning of the school year where you're like, who's your mom, who's your dad? Um, and who are your grandparents? And you're listing like your family tree and you're writing things about your, your family. Um, well, the culture box is different in that we know that our students come from different family um, structures. And so like, for example, my particular family, I was married before um, my current husband that I'm married to. And so my kids always have to draw another line to draw, to write my, hus my hu current husband in um, with their dad. And we are a blended family that works together. Um, to raise our kids. And so part of the culture box is really ensuring that um, as students experience their life in a different way, that they're able to bring their selves and it doesn't look like they are so different if their family structure, um, say, for example, is different or their upbringing is different, but it gives them the ability to examine where they are. Um, especially because we do have a large um, homeless and foster population that they may not know the, the history of their, their birth family. And so they can bring in, you know, their current situation and bring in what they feel comfortable sharing. Because some of those things they don't feel comfortable sharing. And so we just want to make it, it relevant for our students. 
Um, so that's a part of one of the activities. So I'm gonna go to module number two. Um, and again, as Mr. Salcedo <laughs> stated, um, we're bringing in the requirements of the state, but then also looking at our local history. So Ms. Wakefield. I will be brief. Just speaking to the remaining three modules, they take us through similar essential questions, learning objectives, performance tasks, and as we've stated a few times, that it's deeply rooted in our local history. So one example you can see with the history movement and community, we would of course talk about the Sherman Indian School because that is so instrumental in Riverside County's history. For module three with the systems of power and injustice, um, we would also be following some literacy practices and those soft skills like a structured Socratic seminar. So in that sense, Socratic seminars are not debates. They're specifically structured to be an open questioning forum to better understand a topic. And it's not teacher um, driven in the sense where teachers are giving the questions. It's students creating questions and trying to just grapple with those essential questions that um, they're dealing with and looking at our local history in order to have some basis of evidence to discuss those questions, but they're really just bringing in their own experiences as well. So that would be an example of a performance task for module three. And then for module four, when we look at the social movements, equity and actions, um, as mentioned earlier, there's a heritage TikTok video, that's a sample, I think, in sake of time, maybe you guys can look at it at your own leisure. Okay, um, but just to reiterate, these are all ways for students to engage with one another, um, to learn more about our local history, in addition to um, really just finding unity and connection and, and getting that sense of confidence um, across those four pillars. Um, one of the um, com professional developments that was up there um, is a team, um, we attended the LA County Office of Education um, professional development of aligning our ethnic studies to the seal of civic engagement for students. And so um, in developing the course of study, um, they um, identified an, a culminating project uh, that would count towards um, the civic seal of engagement and that is an ethnography. Um, so in order to complete the ethnography, um, students would work through these seven questions. What they're going to study, what they already know, or at least they think they know, <coughs> that does require them to uh, have field work. Um, community service field work is a requirement um, for the civic seal of engagement. And the civic seal of engagement is interesting because like ethnic studies, the state um, has identified that we have the civic seal of engagement. However, they have left it to the local education agencies to identify the criteria specifically to that um, agency. Um, and reviewing, um, they would review their field notes, they get informed, they look for meeting, they expect, um, reflect on the experience. And so they can use the ethnography to study um, local community subcultures, religious ceremonies, traditional events, holidays, sporting events that they're pertinent to the community culture. Um, and, and so this opens up an opportunity for them to tie in what they're learning from the course and what is happening in the world around them. Um, this assignment satisfies some of the six um, proven practices for the effective um, civic learning that are outlined by the California Department of Education and are required to be incorporated into the civic seal of engagement um, certification that students would receive. These are the requirements set forth by the state. How we do this is left up to the local education agency. They recommend that um, LEAs determine the, um, the how basically do this and consult with uh, diverse um, credentials uh, teachers cur and current teachers who are teaching history, social science, and our government. So at this point, we don't have those specifics. That would be something that um, once we're, we've adopted, then our, our team would come together of history and social science teachers, and we would work through that criteria, and then that criteria would, would move forward um, so that students can earn that. And basically what it is is a seal that goes on their, their diplomas. Um, 
similar to the seal of um, biliteracy or multiliteracy. You go through the California Department of Education to order those seals to put them on there. Uh, one of the learnings we had from LA County is to be careful when you're ordering the seal because the diplomas are running out of room for all the stickers that go on there, so we have to be careful, just some, a minor detail there. But this goes through what they need to have, um, being engaged in a productive way. They need to demonstrate understanding. They do this typically through their successful completion of US history, government, and economics classes um, while they're in high school, um, completion of the, um, the ethnic studies class, and then that ethnography component um, is what would satisfy some of the other um, uh, criteria that are, are up there. Um, the other piece of it is that we acknowledge that not every uh, parent may want their student to participate in achieving the seal of engagement, even though the course of ethnic studies is a required graduation course. So there would be an alternative assignment or an opt out for those that did not want their parent or their student at the end of the year to complete that portion. And there would be no penalty to the student. At that point, I'm going to turn us over to our esteemed counselor, Mr. Ivan Lumba. Right. How's everyone doing? All right. So I've been fortunate enough to be a part of this committee since the navigational differences. So I've been here for like the, we call it the BC era, which is before COVID era, right? <laughs> so, so the idea is, is that when we're developing a lot of these things, we want to have multiple lenses in regards to how these things are written, especially when you're looking at the counseling perspective, administration, teaching, and everything on, uh, uh, that, that encompasses all of the educational systems that we have here. Um, with counseling, not only are we looking at the 25, uh, 225 requirement or the 185 requirement, we're also making sure that each student has the quality education that is duly deserved for the students. Um, with this being a state requirement, we want to have that flexibility. So not only is this curriculum based on a G requirement through the A through G CSUs or Cal States, but it's also encompassing a merit of the SEAL. I know a lot of the times these SEALs don't really mean much. A lot of the kids are always getting them and things like that, but our kids work hard. And a lot of our kids do a lot of civic engagements. With that civic engagements, a lot of them use it as a merit to get an extra five credits of electives, anything like that. But now they're actually gonna get a seal that could be posted in their college resume, can be posted in their field of study resume if they were gonna go to the workforce and said, hey, I did things for my community. I worked on this thing. This is why I want to do this course work. Um, I think it's very instrumental where the process have been from our inceptions of the BC era to where it is now, where multiple lenses are being looked at. And I, I think uh, for counselors, it gives us the opportunity to be flexible. Flexible in, our, in where we put kids in, flexible with parents, flexible in a merit where we could say, you know, this class is important and it could fulfill these college preparatory requirements that could be great, guided towards the CSU or Cal State system. So I think that for, for, for the most part, with the seal and the, the letter requirements, it, it does encompass a, a full lens and this full spectrum of support for the students. <laughs> well, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to come up and just talk to you just really briefly about some of the benefits. I want to thank the committee for all of their hard work with ethnic studies. And it does benefit um, on the pupil services side of the house as well. Uh, studies have shown that we have an increase of five-year graduation rate by 15%. We have a reduced unexcused absences by five to seven percent, um, which really is uh, all about pupil services and making sure our students are coming to school. When they have a reason, when they are engaged in some way or another with school, that we do see an increase in attendance and increase in grades and achievement. So uh, increase in credits, as we, the slide shows, and post-secondary enrollment by 13.4 and 14.9 percentage points. So all of those are great benefits um, that has been researched and is a plus on the pupil services side of the house. Thank you. Oh, yes. Obviously, the benefits are great, um, but I'm just curious how the impact's going to be 
For sure. Thank you so much for your question. It actually was something I was going to go over on our last slide um, because many of the districts do it a little differently. Um, many were early adopters. Um, so for example, Valverde Unified um, School District utilizes as their 10th grade English course. So they have taken out 10th grade English and they have dropped in ethnic studies meeting the 10th grade standards but teaching it through ethnic studies. Um, our team did extensive research across the state um, and even the country of how people are utilizing um, ethnic studies. Some do it through film, um, some do it through social science, um, some take out uh, like a U.S. history and they have U.S. history through ethnic studies. Um, but that is something that our team, you know, really, really grappled with at the very, very beginning. And so um, that's why we settled on the G requirement because we are not taking out any of our standard English or our standard social science, but we're adding an additional course um, because we felt that it would be great for our students to you know, have the opportunity to have all of their standard courses, um, but then also have the opportunity to take this as well. So along the state, around the state, it's, it's the same concept where um, school districts are deciding different things um, which is again why we brought it to the study session because this is how we've designed it for now. However, if you provide us with direction that you would like us to see it through an English course or through US history, then we would make those adjustments. Um, but one of the conversations that the team had um, actually at the last meeting was how much richer would the content be for students to have ethnic studies after they take world history, um, but before they take US history. So they have this background of their local context and then they find out what was happening in the United States all around the same time and what a richer discussion it could be. And so that's something that hasn't been decided yet of which order it could come in. Um, but we just talk about how much richer those discussions in those social science classes could be if the students understand themselves um, as a person first, but then also what has happened in their local context in their neighborhoods, and then connect that as a whole with the context of the, <coughs> the United States history. Well, right now we've looked at the sections that would be required um, because right now it is a social science credential. Um, what we are like hoping is that, you know, as the state realizes that this is an unfunded, you know, they, the state didn't provide us with additional money to implement ethnic studies. Um, they provided us with a one-time grant um, that was, you know, just enough money for us to pull teachers out and, you know, send them to a few experiences so that they could build capacity, um, but it's not ongoing money. Um, and so, sorry. go ahead. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I'm just gonna, we also, we uh, mandate two, two, 225 credits to graduate. 55 of those are, are elective credits. But if a kid goes, we have seven period a day, if a kid goes four years, seven period a day, they can earn up to 280 credits. So we can, we have options available there if we wanna make it a, just drop 10 credits of elective, or do we want to add 10 more credits on the graduation requirements? But that's something they can talk about and get a recommendation from our committee. For sure. The committee also has gone back and forth with the grade span. Um, we did believe that the ninth grade would not be appropriate for, um, for students because they're just entering high school and they're still kind of learning about themselves and in the new space. And as we talked about the novels of like, the, the maturity level of students, you know, when they're first entering high school. And so the team has discussed it being a 10th grade um, class or above. Um, so part of the, the, the support for teachers in this process um, is that we've been having the collaborative work days um, at the monthly um, equity committee meetings where the teachers are able to collaborate with each other. We also have offered additional pullout days. Um, we have offered um, peer observation, site visits, because we have pockets in our district that, um, for example, Mr. Saucedo teaches the Latin American Studies class at um, Paris High School. So we've offered, if teachers want to see what that looks like in action, go visit Mr. Saucedo and see what a best practice classroom looks like at age appropriate level with vetted materials um, and students engaged in that way. Um, we've also encouraged our teachers to um, attend the different conferences and our classified staff. You all, two of you were with us when we went to the RCOE um, Excellence Through Equity. We have another team going to the San Diego Equity Conference in Janu later in January. Um, and then other experiences as they come up, like they went to the Los Angeles County Office of Education. 
presentation. And so we're just looking for the different ways that are going on along the state just to ensure that we're doing our due diligence um, and not just saying, okay, this is what <laughs> Valverde did, so we want to do it too, or this is what um, Menifee did, so let's do it too. But we're just looking to see what fits our context and what direction um, do you all have for us that we can ensure that we are meeting the state requirements, but that we're also being very, very thoughtful and engaging our current demographic. And then once we know that once the pilot begins, there will need to be some ongoing collaboration um, because you know you all know as teachers, you get in the classroom and you think you have like the best lesson plan. And then you get in front of the students and you're like, uh-oh, not really sure, we need to make some adjustments. And so we would have some ongoing collaboration via Google Meets of some of our teachers that do the pilot and then also some um, pullout days as well. So that's the plan to support the teachers. Um, and so some next, uh, no, go ahead. Script. So uh, when you do the pilot program, when that time comes, is it only going to be on like one specific school or like one teacher for every school or how does that pilot program go? So we haven't decided. It's really just based off of the direction that you all provide us with um, what you would like to see and then going back to the committees to see what is feasible and then also ultimately looking at the fiscal impact of um, how many sections we could add um, that would not put a burden on our schools. And then once... Would be to do it at each school if that's feasible? For sure. At least one section at each school if the pilot program. How much, like... Of like, how much is a grant that they gave us that that one time grant? I would have to get the exact mm -hmm. um, number for you, mm -hmm. um, but it was not even enough to fund one position. <laughs> yes, yeah. it was very very small. Um, just ideally, so in order to get this um, pilot going for next school year, which, which was the goal, um, we start our master schedule uh, now for next year, and counselors are going to be working to get. Um, class um, registration from our students so we, we want to start getting that process going sooner rather than later and if we're able to to ideally I'd like to see two sections on each campus if it's if it's possible and with two different teachers so we get different perspectives and different lenses I know that's idealistic but I like to shoot high and see how it goes um, um, in terms of getting the biggest feedback before we make a, a firm decision on what this is going to look like for the mandate I have a question, so I mean, you brought it up, uh, so actually just based on what Courtney was just saying. Um, so if, if we're piloting, um, would it be possible, so I know you, you said you want to interject it right before we continue into actual um, national studies when we go to the US. Is it possible, if we're piloting it, um, to maybe do that course, but also then go uh, world American ethnic studies? Because as, as I thought about your comment,
to give a brief um, and Mr. Jones so typically 10th grade is world history 11th grade is US history 12th grade is government and econ and I think there's a conversation of bringing the experts of social studies in um, uh, being married to a social science <laughs> teacher they are very married to the grade level of which their content area is in and I think that that needs to be a larger conversation with the people that are going to be doing the job. So the only place you have space in a four-year student schedule is the freshman year but our teachers had a lot of dialogue about the the nature of talking about race and history mm -hmm. is going to require a little sophistication and maybe an older student so you're now battling what we're battling with we're colleagues here what is the place now the first year as a pilot it's kind of easy because we're offering it as an option maybe a 10th grader or two has a hole in their schedule could take it as the pilot or a junior next year could take it but once you move to a required class ed services and you as a body are going to have to improve this is where we're anchoring the class it will be at this year or you could make an approval that it floats and a student has to just complete it in either the 10th, 11th, or 12th And we have grade. to be very cognizant There's of one more thing. tracking one more thing. everything because in order for a student to be eligible for the seal of civic engagement, they have to be an 11th or 12th grader. Yes. You cannot earn it as a 9th or 10th grader. We can create pathways for it, but we just have to make sure internally we're tracking those because we wouldn't want a kid to lose out. So like the earlier discussion, you're asking the really hard, sophisticated questions that there aren't easy answers for. Um, Schedule-wise, plot in ninth grade works. Right. But sophistication of students. The, the no. conversations that have been around, just in my colleagues, just not in the county, but across the state, we anticipate that we're going to get something in the spring from the state um, because that's what typically happens with the mandate. Everybody's wrestling with this question. Is that they yeah. let you wrestle the with state. it and go through the productive struggle and then they come out with the information at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We agree. I agree. And to link that with the point Dr. Um, Cahoon made, um, we've got to, if we're going to offer this to kids, those offerings happen in April. Um, February. February. Yeah. March, April is when we're building master schedules. So we really need to get the approval for the pilot out of you relatively quickly so that, that can be a choice that they have next month and, and we could then get the data back and report back. We also, um, no added pressure, um, but <laughs> have to get it to um, the course, uh, UC doorways to get it that A through G approval, and we're on, on, on limit for that as well. So, no pressure. And so this is what the proposed this is what the proposed timeline looks like. Um, if we were to um, continue uh, taking your feedback from today, um, is that um, you know of course today is our study session. Um, the parents would continue to meet. Um, as we indicated those dates. Um, the ethnic studies equity team would continue to meet. Um, and then we would have our first read at the January 17th board meeting where you would have the full course so that in February, um, we would have the ability to have the second read and you say, yes, go ahead with the pilot, but you wouldn't do that until the February meeting. So you would have time to, to, to let us know. Um, and then if, the novels um, are, you know, we bring back the information to you this month in January, um, which is, again, a separate, they're two separate items, um, but we would bring the novels for a vote sometime in February um, or March, depending on whatever you all decide when you want it to come back, um, but then we would look at beginning purchasing the novels in time to begin training teachers, um, purchasing the novels that the teachers would want to utilize, um, and then go through the pilot season of, of training them so that when we get to next school year that they would have enough time for training um, and fully understand what that framing looks like because we wouldn't want to just hand this curriculum or this book to these books to anyone and say, okay, have fun and teach it. But we want to be really, really intentional just how, we, how we've been with this process of being intentional with training, with training our teachers. Given the homework you gave us earlier, I'm looking at this and I'm wondering is, and we already have to post the, the agenda for the January board meeting, um, does that need to be pushed back one month? But if you do that, be cognizant of what she's outlined for you. 
we could take and really slow down and do mm -hmm. a lot of question and debate and other study sessions, but you're going to miss your window to order, train, and get it rolled out by next fall. So we're, we need a time for teachers to do this work, then we've got to present it to you, and then we've got a <coughs> finite window to get it and stack those other things down the road. It's, it's, it's a delicate balance. So they, they, the board would have the option to waive one of the readings, especially since it's a pilot. So if they don't have it done by next week when it has to go for January, bring it to the February meeting as a single read. Correct. And, and then we would have more time to, to um, have it ready to go. And we can start putting kids in the class. That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. That kind of, thank you for that grant, because that mm -hmm. keeps us on track, but also allows us time to answer the, to do the homework you've given us today. So we're, we're trying to be really responsive and also keep the district on track for the timeline. It's hard. Questions? No? Um, not questions, just um, I give you guys so much props because this is a lot of research on just the framework on how to do the ethnic studies and, um, and the novels as well. Um, just seeing all the modules, they're all really great uh, performance tests. I know for module three, you guys put Socratic seminar. I actually had one of those in high school at Paris High. It, it really did help me a lot to learn the experiences from different students to understand where, where they came from. I know ours was like a bit emotional because because students actually at that time they were they really opened up on very personal issues, and it's a memory that I still remember. Around just like wow, these students were very uh, open with what they had. So I think uh, all the modules that you guys provided, I believe, would really help students to become more engaging because that's all what students really want. I know some are a little bit more pushed back, but the more we have that open uh, open communication, that, that is where students are really gonna push and they are really gonna take initiative to be open. And I just really appreciate the, the committee and everyone on how this, this is like a very sensitive topic and I really appreciate how you guys were so professional with it and you guys are so open to feedback because this is very important, and I'm very happy that you guys handled it so well. So I really appreciate you guys all. Thank you. We appreciate that. I appreciate you highlighting it. Mm -hmm. There's only one lasting thing to take from both of these presentations. So that this is work driven by teachers. It wasn't that the director of curriculum instruction decided that this is what we're going to do, or the assistant super decided, the superintendent, that we had to cobble together research and information from throughout the state. All right, item 10.1 is adjournment. Do I have a motion to adjourn the special board meeting of trustees? So moved. M Mr. Nelson and Mr. Campos. And when it pops up, please vote. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Is that right, Anna? Because yeah, it's showing 9.1? Okay, there we go. All right, we have a 5-0 vote. The time is 2.33, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.